International pressure mounts against Russian President Vladimir Putin to admit his role in the shootdown of Malaysia Airlines Flight 17. Putin continues to blow the blame back in the faces of those who call him a killer. And as the retorts grow in anger, how will the world hold him responsible? From both sides of the aisle, there are two words on the lips of everybody and wondering what the Obama administration is doing to repair the damage. The two words, foreign policy. It's more critical than you might want to believe. And former Virginia Governor Jim Gilmore is here to dive into the debate. And while there is certainly time for everything to change, the idea is growing that Hillary Clinton has already damaged her campaign too much to succeed in any election cycle. We dig into the strategy behind it all. The fastest three hours of news begins the weekly run and more news and factual information than you will find at any Alphabet Network. We question everything from Monday, July 21st, 2014. This weekend saw an anniversary that all too often is missed every year here in America and around the world. And in light of what is happening at this very moment in Europe, it's a sad commentary on what America has allowed itself to become. That's the focus of telling it like it is later on this hour. All this after John Bachman delivers another edition of Newsmax Now. Thank you for that, Ed. A lot of folks were hoping the president would give more information about what will be next in terms of the uh, flight, the Malaysia Airlines flight MH17. Today we got a hint of that, the president speaking at the White House today. Here is a brief clip of what he had to say. As I said before, you have international teams already in place prepared to conduct the investigation and recover the remains of those who have been lost. But unfortunately, the Russian-backed separatists who control the area continue to block the investigation. They've repeatedly prevented international investigators from gaining full access to the wreckage. As investigators approached, they fired their weapons into the air. The separatists are removing evidence from the crash site, all of which begs the question, what exactly are they trying to hide? Well, the president also put more pressure on Vladimir Putin to step up to the plate here. Of course, uh, the president did not take any question from the media that were assembled there. We'll keep you updated as we get more information in terms of the situation on the ground. Meantime, in the Middle East, so far today, more than 60 rockets have been fired into Israel by Hamas militants. The Israeli Defense Forces say 14 of those rockets were intercepted by the Iron Dome. As of today, some 1,800 rockets have been fired from Gaza, which on average has about 140 rockets launched off each day. Israel is fighting for the entire Western world, the entire civilized world, because if terrorism is allowed to continue from hospitals and mosques and schools, and that's what Hamas uses to launch their rockets, <clears throat> then, you know, it's coming to a theater near you. There, of course, is Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz speaking to us on America's Forum earlier here today. Meantime, Israeli airstrikes continue to pound Gaza as the death poll among Palestinians climbs over 500, that according to health officials inside Gaza. Meantime, 20 Israelis have also died in Operation Protective Edge, including 13 soldiers who died this past weekend. As we just told you there, Harvard Law Professor Alan Jer Dershowitz talked about the situation and says that John Kerry may not be able to do much as he moves over to that region today to try and address the situation headed to Cairo, the Secretary of State is. Uh, however, uh, Israel, uh, Israel has also caught a lot of heat from some news organizations and some pro-Palestinian activists for attacking many of the sites due to fear of casualties. But this week, Bill Maher, a liberal comedian who many of you are familiar with and talk show host said Israel isn't getting a fair shake and agreed with conservative guests on his show, uh, on his HBO show, uh, that who is really to blame for this crisis? Well, it's Hamas. Nobody seems to ask whose fault is that mostly. I feel terrible for a Palestinian child who dies, but if it's your father, your brother, your uncle who is firing those rockets into Israel, whose fault is it really? Do you really expect the Israelis not to do, not to retaliate? Well, we heard from Michael Reagan earlier on America's Forum asking where Hollywood is. It's rare to hear Bill Maher step up, but he weighed into the fray on his program. As we mentioned, Kerry headed to Cairo today. Not sure what he expects to, to have happen there, but we do expect him to lean a little heavier on Palestinian uh, authorities to accept that Egyptian-backed ceasefire plan. More ahead here, more news in 30 minutes. Now back to Ed.
Violence and conflict inevitably lead to unforeseen consequences. Russia, these separatists, and Ukraine all have the capacity to put an end to the fighting. Meanwhile, the United States is going to continue to lead efforts within the world community to de-escalate the situation, to stand up for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine, and to support the people of Ukraine as they courageously work to strengthen their democracy and make their own decisions about how they should move forward. Put one ear to the political ground these days, and it won't be hard to feel the rumble and hear the discourse when it comes to American foreign policy, or as many would say, what foreign policy? President Barack Obama can stand at the podium and make comments such as his most recent notable, we live in a complex world and at a challenging time. But statements such as these are tossed off more as speech filler than a serious course of action. And it's that global gap in American foreign policy and leadership that has people of all stripes wondering what, if anything, this administration can or should do in order to bring some stability to a world that is hemorrhaging bloody discourse at so many turns. Let us welcome into Midpoint a former counterintelligence agent for the U.S. Army, founder of AmericanOpportunity.org, and the former governor of the state of Virginia, Jim Gilmore, joined us. Governor, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you, Ed. Governor, I'd like to begin, first of all, before we turn to Israel, I want to ask your opinion on what the president has just said within the last hour or so regarding the Ukrainian crisis. What exactly are they trying to hide, of course, pointing to Vladimir Putin and the Russians? He did say that if Russia continues to violate Ukraine's sovereignty, Moscow, quote, will only further isolate itself, unquote, and the economic costs will continue to increase. Did he go far enough, or is this really only as far as he can go at this point? Well, I, th I think that the economic sanctions are vital. I think they should be continue to be squeezed. But I think that we also have to put the, put the blame exactly where it belongs. And that is Vladimir Putin and the Russian people have decided that they're going to expand their country back out again. They're unhappy with the fact that uh, Ukraine is separate. They're fomenting this kind of rebellion and this kind of insurgency in the eastern Ukraine. And we have to just say that this is the cause of this problem. This is the reason why you have this kind of collateral damage like this terrible tragedy that we've seen with this passenger airliner. And we have to say that this is not right, it's not appropriate, and it's wrong. Now, I think that we continue to squeeze economically in every way that we can, but we also have to begin to make a statement here about whether or not the people of Ukraine have a right to territorial integrity and the right to self-determination. There's no need for them to necessarily be drawn into a NATO alliance, but if their desire is to have further economic attachments to the European Union and to the Western world, we should not permit them to be drugged back into an Eastern community that really is, is not really forward-looking in the 21st century. I'm going to bring up a quote here from Russian President Vladimir Putin. You may have heard it already, and I want to make sure that our viewers see this as well. And this is a quote, no one should and no one has the right to use this tragedy to achieve their own selfish political goals. These events should not divide but unite people. For its part, Russia will do everything that we can so that the conflict in eastern Ukraine moves from today's military phase to a discussion phase at the bargaining table by exclusively peaceful and diplomatic means. Governor, is there any reason whatsoever for anybody in a sane world to not believe that Vladimir Putin is nothing more than a blatant liar, has blood on his fingers, and quite frankly would do anything he can at this point to bring back what was the USSR and throw this world back into a Cold War? We should not think anything else. That's what he is doing. This is not the, something that the Western, it's, it's, it's in the Western community's interests. He is the one that is directly responsible for fomenting this rebellion. It is a part of national policy of Russia, and it's inappropriate and wrong, and we have to say so. And that brings you to the second point. The, the president is so mild and so indefinite and so uncertain. He's such an uncertain trumpet of, of America today that he is going to send messages of uncertainty in the world and it's going to create more and more problems. And that's the problem that we have to face today. The, President Obama is too weak and, uh, and I think that it's inappropriate and we have to be stronger out of the United States leadership. 
Many people in America turning to Israel have already said they don't want us involved. There's a new poll out, as a matter of fact, that says they don't want us involved in the Ukraine. They don't want us involved in Israel right now. So looking at that mild and indefinite leader that we have at this moment right now, what in essence can the president actually do? And again, we're turning to Israel now with regard to what's happening there other than simply issuing statements and supporting Israel as much as he possibly can, at least verbally and with Patriot missiles. This problem is, once again, an uncertain voice that's come out of the United States that encourages people that want to eliminate uh, the, the nation, the country of Israel, to do this kind of conduct. I think that we have to reassert our strength and our support for the nation of Israel. Uh, and then at that point, you're going to begin to send messages into people in the Arab community that it is not acceptable to have this kind of conduct. Otherwise, what choice does Israel have? We would never tolerate missiles being fired from an adjacent country in terrorizing our people and causing them to have to live in cellars. They have to do what's necessary. But in the long run, what is essential is American leadership to once again reaffirm our commitment to the existence of the Israeli state, make it clear to the Arab community surrounding them that the destruction of the state of Israel is not acceptable to the United States, and that we will take whatever steps that are necessary to preserve the nation of Israel. And indeed, the people of the Arab community should come to the table, recognize this, this reality that the United Nations has recognized, that Jordan has recognized, that Egypt has recognized for decades and decades, and then at that point reach some kind of accommodation or solution in the Middle East, but not one that threatens the existence of Israel. That is not acceptable. You mentioned the United Nations here. United Nations Chief Ban Ki-moon recently called this latest incursion by Israel. He called Israel's incursion atrocious and said it must do far more to protect civilians. Let's look at this in a couple of minutes we have left from a couple of standpoints here. First of all, from the UN standpoint, this is the United Nations, but in essence, is there any reason to believe that they are getting anything done or they can or that every time they make a statement, it is simply just that, a paper statement that flies in the wind with no power behind it whatsoever. Well, I, th I think that's exactly right. The, the problem is, once again, that is sending some sort of even-handed accommodationist type of message out of the United Nations that's actually contrary to their original commitment to the state of Israel. Now, this is just not acceptable. It's not appropriate. And, and let's recognize this. If... Um, if there were no missiles being fired by Hamas into Israel, would these incursions be occurred? Would, would this be happening? Of course not. So I think that the point is this. We have to remember to place reasonable responsibility onto Hamas. If they're firing missiles, they know good and well that the Israelis are going to have to respond. And when they do, then there's going to have to be uh, a, an appropriate response. So the, Hamas bears a responsibility on this. The United Nations ought to be saying that. They ought to be saying that no sovereign nation has to suffer this kind of attack and that Hamas is in violation of international law and the rules of international norms in doing what they're doing. I've only got about a minute left here. Is the United Nations simply spineless? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Is the United Nations, when you look at something like this, when Ban Ki-moon makes a statement, are they simply just spineless in many ways? when they take the Israelis to task for what they're doing? I think that there's an international norm here that is, is anti-Israel, and it's causing a coloration of reality. The reality is that, that, that this is not a case of some type of resistance by somebody to Israel. This is an assault upon another people. If the missiles stop, the incursions will stop. But this is the long-term approach is that people have got to understand the United Nations could play a role, a constructive role in this, that there needs to be a reasonable long-term settlement that's good for the Palestinian people, makes peace with the Arab world, and also allows Israel to flourish and exist as the nation that they are in reality. These are the directions we have to go. Strong American leadership is called for. We're not getting that out of President Obama. We're getting uncertain voices, and that is creating uncertainty and instability and and, and this type of uh, this type of fighting that's going on. Governor Gilmore, pleasure to have you on the show. Please come back and let's do it again. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Next up, 
We want you to follow the smoking gun, or in this case, the tire tracks left behind by the missile launcher. Is there any sane individual willing to fall for anything Vladimir Putin says? We dove into it a little bit here at the top and right after what the president said today. We'll do it some more right here on Midpoint, where we question everything. As women, we always talk about how we should look or what's the best way to lose weight. But for me, it finally became all about how I feel. No tricks, just me. I looked in the mirror and I saw what I didn't want to see, the truth. I was 50 pounds overweight. That was a rough day. That's when I decided I had to lose weight. So I chose the only simple option for me, Nutrisystem. Now you can lose weight even faster with a Fast Five kit from Nutrisystem. Lose five pounds your first week or your money back, guaranteed. I lost 50 pounds on Nutrisystem. Order your 28-day My Way plan and we'll rush you the Fast Five kit free. You'll get a week of fantastic energizing shakes, one week of delicious craving crusher shakes, and a free week of 21 delicious meals, and it's all free. So why do I keep telling you about Nutrisystem? Because it works, and I know it'll work for you. Call 877-271-DIET and lose your first five pounds free. This is a national health care alert from the Health Hotline. If you, a family member, or a loved one suffers from knee pain and have Medicare as your primary insurance, we've got great news. You could qualify for a pain-relieving knee brace at little or no cost to you. Get free delivery, and all the paperwork is handled by our accredited suppliers at no charge to you. If you're on Medicare and have knee pain, don't wait. You may qualify to immediately receive a pain relieving brace at little or no cost. Call the health hotline right now for details toll free at 877-530-9847. Friendly agents are standing by 24 seven to help you. We also have other pain relieving braces available for shoulder, ankle, and your back. You may be eligible to receive these items and more at little or no cost to you as well. Call right now for details toll free at 877-530-9847. Please remember this number, 877-530-9847. Our friendly representatives are standing by now to take your call. Please call us right now at 877-530-9847. Now on Newsmax TV. Has a new border war erupted with Mexico? Find out the surprising truth. Watch Newsmax TV to find out. Go now to Newsmax TV. This certainly will be a wake-up call for uh, Europe and the world that uh, there are consequences to an escalating uh, conflict in eastern Ukraine, that it is not going to be localized, it is not going to be contained. Um, you know, what, what we've seen here is um, just in one country alone, uh, our, our great allies, uh, the Dutch, 150 or, or more of their citizens uh, being killed. Um, and, and that, I think, sadly brings home the degree to which uh, the stakes are high for Europe, uh, not simply for the Ukrainian people, and, and that we have to be firm in our resolve in making sure that uh, uh, we are uh, supporting uh, Ukrainians' efforts uh, to bring about uh, a just ceasefire uh, and that we can move towards a political solution to this. It's difficult in a world filled with political and opportunistic liars to find one that is working at the level of Vladimir Putin at the moment. Then again, I ask anyone who is even a casual student of watching the world over the last decade or so if this would surprise anybody. But he's been lying for years with zero reason to worry the world will be able to touch him. So what, if anything, has really changed at the present? That and much more from inside the Beltway. Let's welcome to Midpoint former speechwriter for Bill Clinton and now editor-in-chief of the Washington Monthly, Paul Glastris joins us. Paul, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Ed. Paul, the president in his press conference talked about consequences for Vladimir Putin and for Russia. Honestly, now, are there people within Washington who believe that there are real consequences here? Because as I noted, Putin has been getting away for this for years, with this for years. What makes anybody think that the president now has the juice to make him knuckle under? Well, I think there have been consequences all along, and he's been feeling them. And you know, the Russian economy is not an isolated economy the way it was uh, during the Cold War. It's integrated with the rest of the world economy. They have flows of money, goods, uh, exports, imports, and uh, 
the president just a couple days prior to this incident uh, put out tougher sanctions on Russia um, as a consequence of the buildup of uh, uh, activity in eastern Ukraine. Um, and now with this horrible tragedy, he has leverage in the form of support from Europe, which previously was not interested in losing some money of its own in order to back up these sanctions. Now we're hearing just this morning from EU leaders that they're uh, uh, getting behind the sanctions the president put forward, as is the Canada and some other countries. So, so the, these are not, uh, that's not a small amount of leverage. Um, it's a significant amount of leverage. We'll have to see if it's enough to change Putin's behavior, but it's, it, he always had limited uh, means to, to affect change in this part of the world, but he's using what he has, I think, fairly deftly. Paul, I want you to catch this now because here's a comment that I'm going to read from Ukrainian Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsin, uh, Yatsenyuk, which I think will launch us a little bit into the next part of this. He says, and I quote this, international crime against humanity must be investigated by the International Commission. I underline once again that we are ready to pass the guidance and coordination of this investigation to the Netherlands as the country that suffered the most with the involvement of the whole international community. Paul, it's those last couple of words, I think, that make me stop and a lot of people to have pause. The international community. Is this president going as far as he can? Because simply put, we need the EU to stand up and do something here when, quite frankly, they have not been willing to do anything and not really been willing to help becoming part of the solution for, for decades now, it seems. Well, I'm not sure I would go so far as not being part of the solution or for decades, but I think unquestionably you're right that the, the Europeans uh, are less willing to uh, enter into these sanctions because their economies are more exposed to Russia. Remember, Russia holds the valve on the natural gas going into Europe. Cut off that natural gas and Europe go, can go into a recession. So European leaders have to be cognizant of their own voters uh, who, who don't want to suffer uh, you know, from their own pocketbooks for the fate of some people in, in Ukraine. Now, I think that calculus has changed politically because, precisely because of the downing of this, of this airliner. They're, their own people have, at least from the Netherlands, have been killed, 150 of them. And so using the international community, especially the EU, as leverage at this point is a, a very smart thing to do. Has Putin been exposed in some ways? Because if you look, the real inability to broker a ceasefire, this would seem to many to indicate a real lack of control of the separatist militia here. Now, we've talked about this before, and it would seem as if the fact that Russia says yes they say no, that simply what we have here is a, a band of thugs, if you will, or free roaming individuals that Russia really has no control over whatsoever? Well, I'm, I'm not sure they have no control whatsoever, but you know, it was an enormous plunder on the part of Vladimir Putin and his, uh, his you know, advisors to hand you know, uh, service to air missiles of this, of this uh, quality to what uh, one blogger called a bunch of rustic morons, uh, you know, who <laughs> use it to, you know, inadvertently, I think, shoot down an international jetliner. And he's paying the price for putting in motion uh, events that he cannot hope to control. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he, Russia has already paid a price for this, and I think they're going to continue to pay a price. The price that they will pay for this, in essence, is there anything that they can do at this point or anybody can do to bring Putin to the realization that we had some sort of responsibility in this? Or is it simply going to be, as I pointed out at the front, that he will continue to skate and slide as much as he can because he realizes, simply put, that he can get away with it? I, I, I do think he knows he can get away with a lot. And I think it's, you know, I, I'm not a mind reader nor an expert on, on Russian affairs. Um, a lot of this is my understanding is a lot of this has to do with the internal politics of Russia by standing up for Russia by um, showing Russia's capacity to involve itself in a country right next door and protect ethnic Russians he shores up his own his own support he minimizes uh, any threats to his power so you know th this is a, a lot of this is about domestic affairs um, 
if billions of dollars are being lost by allies of Putin's because of economic sanctions, that could change calculus. Paul, I want to spin for a minute if we can here because I want to specifically focus on an article that you had in Washington Monthly that caught my attention, caught a lot of people's attention, simply because of the title that you had on it. It was called The Big Lobotomy, How Republicans Made Congress Stupid. Would you like to expand on that a little bit? Because I will gather that certainly my simply just saying those words will aggravate a few people. Well, I, you know, I would urge people to read the story. It can be read on WashingtonMonthly.com. And it tells the story of basically a 50-year uh, a 50-year story beginning in the early 70s when uh, liberal Democrats and moderate Republicans built up the capacity of Congress by hiring staff and creating new agencies to be able to uh, engage in analysis of problems and find solutions uh, in a complex world. And then in 1995, with the rise of Newt Gingrich and his um, revolutionaries in Congress, uh, you found Republicans essentially cutting by 20, 30 percent or more the staff buildup that, it ha that happened over the previous 25 years. And it's really never been built back up again. And so even though, and the aim here for Gingrich and others was to uh, get rid of what they thought were people who were getting in the way of conservative uh, legislation with the aim of shrinking government. Of course, in the 25 years since, government's grown by 50 percent, so it actually hasn't worked by conservative terms. What it has done is two things. One, absent having this personnel, these experts under their own control, Congress has had to outsource, in a sense, uh, its policymaking to the lobbyists on K Street and to uh, various think tanks and private concerns. Um, and so you you know you you've seen the rise of even greater power in the hands of corporate lobbyists, and the second thing it's done is it's taken away Congress's ability to do oversight over the federal government and other aspects of the country. So what's been the result? Well, I'll give you two examples. Why was it that Congress was completely flat-footed and didn't understand the depth and breadth of the NSA's uh, spying pro uh, programs? Well, here's a fun fact. Um, the, uh, in, in the intelligence budget has doubled in real terms since 1997, but the number of staffers in the Senate Intelligence Committee has declined during the same amount of period. Uh, same period. I've only got so about 20 seconds. I've only got about 20 seconds. Can I just ask you quickly, is it fair to say that we need a big lobotomy on both sides in Washington? I think both sides ought to come together and rebuild the capacity of Congress to do its job, and for that you need personnel who are paid well and stick around and don't go work for lobbyists, and I think that's in the interest of conservatives as well as liberals. Ah, the dirty L word, the lobbyist word, always gets in there some way. Paul, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. The article is, of course, on WashingtonMonthly.com. We appreciate your time. We'll do it again. Thank you, Ed. All right, thank you very much, Paul. On deck, putting the words authentic and Hillary Clinton into the same sentence. Plus a peek at what's making headlines from the Newsmax Mothership website. It's all coming up right here on Midpoint. Is your property a jungle choked with overgrown saplings and brush? Take back your land with a DR field and brush mower. Nothing stops the DR. Thick grass and weeds, out of control brush briars or canes, even three inch thick trees are no match for America's favorite brush mower. Lock it in and rip it up. Clear it out, clean it up, and rediscover the land you've lost. And with optional attachments, the self-propelled DR Field and Brush Mower converts into a finish mower, a snow thrower, a portable chipper, or a grader blade. It's a field and brush cutter and so much more. Call 1-800-456-2023 for a free buyer's guide and DVD. You'll learn how you can try a DR at home for six months for as low as $58 a month and get free shipping. Hurry, this offer won't last. Call 1-800-456-2023. Online at drfieldbrush.com. 
Love the way your tires look right after applying Tire Shine, but hate that it washes right off with the first rainy day? Well, not anymore. Introducing White New Tires, the world's longest lasting tire dressing, a full six months. Just apply White New Tires and let it dry. Your tire's shiny new finish will be protected from snow, slush, and road salts, from mud and muck, and from heat and sand, along with all the normal dust and road grime. And the shine won't wash away. You just see my truck on camera, and as much as I love to go off-roading, I trust only White New to keep it like new. Want proof? We applied White New to half of this tire and sent it through over 100 powerful car washes. White New Tire never washes away. White New Tire will last for six months of real-world environmental exposure, and we guarantee it. Traditional tire dressings can leave a greasy residue and even contain silicone that actually attracts dust. Here's how it works. Our revolutionary tire formula bonds to the surface of your tires, leaves no greasy residue, won't crack or peel, and most importantly, won't wash away, leaving only the white new tire shine. Your tires will look better than new for months to come. Ordinary tire products need to be applied every car wash. Plus, they cause overspray and sling. Not the best thing for your paint. What a waste of time and money. Just apply white new tire shine once, saving you extra work and well over $100 at the car wash. White new tire is only $14.99. Call right now and we'll double your order. Just pay additional handling. That's two white new tire kits, enough to keep the tires on two cars looking shiny and new for a full six months. That's right, you get two white new tire kits for just $14.99. Call now. Order white new tires right now and we'll double the offer. That's right, enough white new tires for two cars. Enjoy your showroom new look for six months, we guarantee it. Call 1-800-401-8251. Call now. Welcome back, I'm Francesca Page and here's your Newsmax Now update. The Ukrainian president and Malaysian foreign minister met today to discuss access to the crash site and the recovery of the bodies of the victims. The president also paid his respect to the victims of the Dow Malaysian Airlines jet. Four days after Flight 17 was shot out of the sky, international investigators still have only limited access to the crash site, hindered by the pro-Russian fighters who control the territory in eastern Ukraine. Outrage over the delays and possible tampering of evidence at the site is building worldwide. Meanwhile, it's turned into a shark frenzy at Massachusetts town. Tourists are buying anything shark-related and can't get enough of the underwater predator. I mean, truthfully, we've probably grown about 500% in terms of the sales of our, our shark apparel. We, we do sell just uh, many days, thousands of dollars worth of it out of our store here. Experts, experts say the increase in shark sightings coincides with a growing seal population. The once feared marine menace is creating some lasting memories for those shark lovers. That's your Newsmax Now update. Now back to Midpoint. I'm going to put that as you're going to need a bigger boat. Americans are speaking loud and clear when it comes to the subjects of the Middle East and Ukraine, all of which puts the president in a very difficult situation as to what he wants to do and what voters want him to do. What we do at the moment is turn to the Newsmax Mothership website for the latest from managing editor Tim Colley, who joins us. Tim, pleasure to have you on board, my friend. And it would seem as if the president is right at the top of things, because if you look at the website, it is Obama. Putin must make rebels cooperate in crash probe. It's all what he said later, to, uh, late this morning, but it's getting a lot of play. Ukraine, some people are reporting that there is some cooperation going on, but while they're trying to recover the bodies at this very moment, there's shelling going on in Donetsk. So they're working in a, in a very active war zone, and that's creating a lot of problems. I think what a lot of people are going to do, Tim, is they're going to look at what the president is saying, and they're still going to look for more action. Also, if you go to the website, you'll find that there's a note a little ways down that talks about the GOP basically saying it's time to go ahead and get something done here, that the president must get on this and must not. He has to call for the, the ceasefire. He has to have sanctions. But I think when the GOP House members started to come after him today and say it is time to really go after Vladimir Putin, he's running out of time, I think, to just dance. Yeah, no. They want more sanctions. They want active aid to the Ukrainian military. They want an effort. It looks like it's coming together to get the Europeans on board um, and, and really go after Putin. The one thing that I think uh, probably you as a newsman as well and a lot of us will look at here, and if, even if we try to do it and, and be as, as even-handed as we possibly can, 
You say that uh, also here under the Malaysian jet massacre on the website, Putin, MH17 crash shouldn't be used for political aims. It is a darkly humorous thing to hear that coming out of the mouth of Vladimir Putin, isn't it? Yeah, he's definitely playing games. Uh, he came out uh, today with a statement basically blaming the Ukrainians, and he continues to do that. While on the other side of his mouth, he's asking for an investigation, which, of course, you know, buys him more time. Um, I think we've got very couple reports now that um, a lot of gear has been actively moved off that record site and possibly back into Russia. I think something that we're going to be watching here today and probably into tomorrow as well is what's coming out of Texas. We are awaiting what is supposed to be a 2 o'clock press conference. At least that's what was first announced. The Texas Governor Rick Perry was going to announce that he would be sending the National Guard down to the border. It is already on the website. Governor Perry accused of militarizing the border by sending 1,000 troops. A lot of people will not be happy about this, but it's a little bit shocking, I guess, that it's taken this long to get there. Yeah, um, it is. Why a thousand in the that much to think about the border? The, the counter argument against this is what they really need is more assistance from the law enforcement that are down there. But I mean, it's clear Perry's when something needs to be done. He didn't see it coming from the federal government. There's a lot of resistance to the um, Obama plan, which can provide a lot of money for active law enforcement on that security on that border. So, uh, Perry, it's a lot to look at on the website, Tim. We appreciate your time. Tim Colley joining us again, Newsmax.com. Get all the news from there. We'll follow it as the day goes on. Right now, though, let's take a moment here on Midpoint. Stop down and revisit another American moment. Four years, eight months, and one day after the Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, marking America's entrance into World War II, a B-29 bomber nicknamed the Enola Gay dropped the world's first atomic weapon. The date was August 6th, 1945. In a split second, the world had entered the nuclear age. Captain Paul Tibbetts, Jr., in command of the Enola Gay, gave a first-hand account of the events for reporters back home. Well, as the bomb left the airplane, we took over uh, manual control, made it an extremely steep turn to try and put as much distance between ourselves and the explosion as possible. With the Japanese refusing to surrender and Allied intelligence determining that a land invasion of their homeland could result in a million Allied casualties while killing many more Japanese, President Truman ordered the first atomic bomb be dropped on Hiroshima. Dubbed Little Boy, the device exploded 1,900 feet above the awakening Japanese city of Hiroshima, instantly reducing 68,000 of the city's buildings to rubble and annihilating some 80,000 plus people. Despite the devastation, the Empire of Japan again refused to surrender. Consequently, three days later, on the 9th, a second atomic weapon was dropped on the city of Nagasaki with the same devastating results. Still, the Japanese refused to surrender. So a third atomic bomb was being prepared to be dropped on Tokyo itself. On the 15th of August, 1945, the Emperor of Japan had announced the unconditional surrender of his nation. The greatest war known to man was finally over. For Newsmax TV, I'm Bill Curtis, and this is an American moment. Meet Mary. She loves to shop online with her debit card. And so does Bill, an identity thief who stole Mary's identity, took over her bank accounts, and stole her hard-earned money. Unfortunately, millions of Americans just like you learn all it may take is a little misplaced information to wreak havoc on your life. This is identity theft, and no one helps stop it better than LifeLock. LifeLock offers the most comprehensive identity theft protection available. If Mary had LifeLock's bank account alerts, she may have been notified before it was too late. LifeLock's credit notification service is on the job 24-7. As soon as they detect a threat to your identity within their network, they will alert you, protecting you, before the damage is done. LifeLock has the most comprehensive identity theft protection available, guarding your social security number, 
your money, your credit, even the equity in your home. My years as a prosecutor taught me that we all need to protect ourselves from crime. In today's world, that includes identity theft. It's a serious problem. We all have to protect ourselves. While identity theft can't be completely stopped, no one works harder to protect you than LifeLock. You even get a $1 million service guarantee. That security no one can beat. You have so much to protect and nothing to lose. When you call LifeLock right now and get 60 days of identity theft protection risk-free. That's right, 60 days risk-free. Use promo code NOTME. Order now and get this document shredder to keep sensitive documents out of the wrong hands. A $29 value, free. Don't wait until you become the next victim. Call 1-800-918-3128 for 60 days of LifeLock identity theft protection risk-free and get a document shredder free. Use promo code NOTME. Call 1-800-918-3128 now. I'm Jean, and this is my one and only Henry. We just love scouring flea markets for special treasures. But with my type 2 diabetes, we now spend all the time at the pharmacy. With Medicare, I don't have to. They deliver everything I need right to my door with free shipping. Plus, Medicare takes private policies, Medicaid, even my Medicare. Sleep apnea machines, nebulizers, Medicare has all the finest medical supplies. The best part, Medicare saves us money. Medicare allows us the time to do the things we love. Medicare, we deliver a better life. What sort of president would she be? Oh, she'd be really good. She's the ablest public servant I ever worked with. It's a decision that only she can make, and I'm not going to try to jump the gun. And if she decides not to do it, I'll be happy to. When, when I left the White House and Hillary went into the Senate in New York, I told her, I said, for 26 years, you made a lot of sacrifices for my public life. So I'll give you the next 26 years. And if I'm still around, then we'll fight about what we're gonna do after that. So we're just a little over halfway through the second 26 years. And whatever she wants is fine with me. Former President Bill Clinton has become the voice of quiet reason with regard to the drumbeat for wife Hillary to run for the presidency in 2016. And as a survivor of the political fray, he is indeed right to point out that any candidate needs time to craft a message and convince voters they are the right person for the job. However, there are those who feel that already the message from Mrs. Clinton has been tainted too severely to allow for damage control. So let's get to the meat of the matter, shall we? Welcome back to Midpoint, author of The War on Millennials, airing grievances and offering solutions through the eyes of America's next generation of leaders, former spokesman for President George H.W. Bush and senior project manager for Hathaway Strategies, Pete Seat joins us on the show. Pete, good to see you again. It's good to see you, Ed. Thanks for having me. Pleasure, Pete. Now, the whole thing here is about Hillary becoming more authentic to appeal to voters. All right, what exactly does that mean? Well, authenticity sells both in life and in politics. And when Hillary Clinton made those comments that she and President Clinton were, quote, dead broke in her words upon leaving the White House, um, she made a disingenuous attempt to, to, quote, be one of us. She was trying to connect with the American who lost a job and had to file for bankruptcy or the student who is suffering from massive student loan debt when in reality she needs to just own it. She needs to own her impressive resume. You may not agree with what she did in those positions, but own the fact that she was Secretary of State and a U.S. Senator and a lawyer and a best-selling author and now a well-compensated speaker on the lecture circuit. Pete, you just hit on something I think that's fascinating, and I've thought about this for a long time here. The American voters sometimes, I believe, want somebody who is a leader, and they don't really care about the empathy. I think, and, and, and you tell me if, if you get this as well, that too many politicians always try to say, I empathize with you. I've been in your shoes. I've done this. Yeah. Sure, that sounds good at, at, at the moment, but it never really comes to fruition. It is usually always proven that they really don't know what happens in those shoes. And is it fair to say that Americans right now are saying, look, just give us some leadership at this point. I don't care if you've been here. Lead, damn it. 
I, I completely agree with you, Ed. As Bill Clinton used to say, I feel your pain. Uh, that's you know <laughs> one of the oft-mocked phrases that he used on the campaign trail and while he was president. I, I phrase it in my book, The War on Millennials, as the battle between the who and the what. And Hillary Clinton is trying to be a who. She wants to be elected if she decides to run for being Hillary Clinton and not much else. But I think more and more Americans are craving the what. They're craving solutions to our problems. And I've yet to hear Hillary offer a single one. But is it not fair to say what President Clinton just said? It takes time to craft a message. We're sitting here right now in July of 2014. We haven't hit the midterms yet. We've got a long way to go here. Isn't it fair to say, though, that whatever misstep she's made, whether it's we're dead broke or anything else, or more serious issues as well, that come a campaign, things have a tendency to get lost in the shuffle? Sure, there's a lot of time between now and then, again, if she chooses to run. But Americans are going to make their impressions. They've made their impressions about her in some respects. She's been on the public stage for decades, ever since the mid-'70s when Bill Clinton was first elected attorney general. Uh, since that moment in time, she's not been a normal person. So her attempts to tr try and be a normal person will not resonate with the American populace. The interesting thing I saw recently, and there was an article in The Hill that talked about something else that, that even I and many other people who talk politics from time to time have been thinking about. They called it the, the GOP's 2016 Hillary paradox, and I think it's very well put. Don't the Republicans, in essence, need Hillary Clinton to be the one who runs from the Democratic side? Because if you get someone that powerful, it will, it will generate a greater uh, passion from the base of the GOP. If it's an Elizabeth Warren or somebody else, you may not have that sort of passion to fight there is, but doesn't having a Clinton on the other side really get them just stoked up to fight another Clinton? Sure, you're going to have uh, the base stoked up. You're going to have a lot of folks going to the polls. But even with Elizabeth Warren, I, I, I don't buy into the Elizabeth Warren love fest that's going on right now. It reminds me a lot of Howard Dean in 2004, and the old line there was uh, Democrats liked the idea of dating Howard Dean, but they didn't want to marry him, as in choose <laughs> him as their nominee. Uh, Hillary will more than likely, if she decides to run, be the nominee, but remember just how inevitable she was in 2008. They're claiming that she's inevitable again here in 2016. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. It is fair to point out, though, that her polling right now, her lead in polling, is a lot larger than it was in 2008. Because as I look at some of the numbers, she's regularly right around 60% in the polls, sometimes even hits 70% in Iowa, where she lost to Obama in 2008. She's now much stronger. So are we sort of getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here and saying that maybe she needs time? She's pretty strong the way it stands right now when you look at the core, isn't she? Sure, but... When Bill Clinton first ran in 1992, he was an asterisk in the polls before ultimately being nominated. I think, however, those numbers you pointed out, Ed, show something very important, and that is the Democrats don't have a bench. It really is Hillary or no one. You know, there's there's talk of Martin O'Malley, the governor of Maryland, and others here and there. Elizabeth Warren obviously getting most of the chatter. Sometimes even Joe Biden getting thrown into the mix. But they're really, Democrats are putting their eggs in this Hillary Clinton basket. And I think over the last several weeks, uh, Americans have been turned off by what they've heard from her. I think it's fair to say that if you look at some of the book performances and some of the other things as well, you just indeed may be right. Uh, speaking of books, <laughs> I want to remind everybody that Pete's seat is The War on Millennials, airing grievances and offering solutions through the eyes of America's next generation of leaders. The generation of leaders we are always asking questions about these days, it is fair to say. Pete, thank you so much for being here today, my friend. We'll do it again soon. Thanks for having me, Ed. All right. It is... Uh, when you look at the numbers, there are those who say that Hillary Clinton's weaknesses are greatly exaggerated. Um, we got a lot of time to go. On our return, the anniversary we forget every year, and what it should be telling us now more than ever about America being a leader on the global stage. Think back to what the date was on Sunday and see if you remember what that anniversary was when we return on Midpoint. Hello, I'm Dr. Ben Carson. To save our health care, let's follow these principles. Our health is the most personal thing we possess. Its care must be under our control. Bureaucracy must be prevented from discouraging choice and innovation. 
Large-scale change shouldn't be imposed from the top down because you have the right to choose what's best for you. Your personal medical information should be your property, period. States should have the flexibility to develop their own options. You should be free to buy coverage consistent with your moral and religious beliefs. Physicians deserve to practice without the fear of frivolous lawsuits. Join me. Save our health care. Please sign our petition today. Call 1-800-425-6299 or visit our website. Call 1-800-425-6299 and sign the petition to save our health care. Save our health care. Sign the petition today. American Legacy PAC is responsible for the content of this advertising. Are you feeling tired, run down, low on energy? Well, you could be just like millions of Americans whose thyroid gland isn't functioning the way it's supposed to. Well, now there's hope to change all of that. Introducing Actolin. Actolin is a premium nutritional supplement designed to support optimal thyroid function. Actolin has 17 powerful ingredients that support adrenal health, thyroid function, energy, and your immune system. Actolin was formulated by the renowned holistic practitioner, Dr. David Brownstein. And now for a limited time, you can get a free bottle of Actolin with our special offer. You pay only for shipping and handling. Act right now and get Dr. Brownstein's free special report, A Doctor's Guide to a Healthy Thyroid. Get Actolin and the special report. Sign up today at getactolin.com. That's getactolin.com. Or call us at the number below. Back in the 50s, sod farmers invented hydroseeding as the easiest way to grow beautiful grass. But you're still doing this. You want a great looking lawn, but have dry spots, dog spots, high traffic areas, and shade. What a nightmare. You seed, water, and wait. But the only thing growing are the weeds. It's no wonder the seed gets washed away, blown away by wind, and eaten by birds. Not anymore. Introducing the revolutionary Hydro Moose Liquid Lawn. With spray and stay technology, the grass grows where you spray it. Start growing with ease. If you can water your lawn, you can hydro seed. Simply attach to any garden hose and turn the dial to seed. Forget the guesswork. Hydro Moose shows you exactly where you're planting. The Green Moose formula contains an eco-friendly sticking solution that attaches the seed to the soil and a conditioner to loosen hard dirt, allowing it to absorb water, resulting in a terrific looking lawn. We sprayed Hydro Moose on this vertical burlap wall and look, the seed locks in place, even upside down. And the grass grows like crazy, even on a vertical wall. It grows in extreme heat or cold conditions. It's perfect for dog spots, high traffic areas, large areas and shade, and no more guesswork. Hydro Moose includes a mixture of high quality seed that blends perfectly with your existing lawn. It's never been faster or easier to get professional results at a fraction of the cost. So why pay a fortune for sod or seed the old fashioned way when you can get the complete Hydro Moose kit for only $19.95 to bring your lawn back to life. That's enough to do 100 spots or 50 square feet. But call now and we'll double the coverage. That's an incredible 200 spots or 100 square feet. And don't forget to ask the operator for large lot and acreage discounts. So don't put up with this when you can have this. Call 1-800-341-7712 or go to hydromoose.com. For the eyes of the world, now look into space to the moon and to the planets beyond. And we have vowed that we shall not see it governed by a hostile flag of conquest, but by a banner of freedom and peace. We have vowed that we shall not see space filled with weapons of mass destruction, but with instruments of knowledge and understanding. Yet the vows of this nation can only be fulfilled if we in this nation are first, and therefore we intend to be first. September 12, 1962, just another day in the life of another American president. Just another speech meant to rouse the masses to a cause that quite often only the politician themselves either has the vision to see needs doing or has the desire to make it happen for selfish reasons. 
John F. Kennedy's speech on the campus of Rice University that day was, to be honest, a little of both. Kennedy was part of the generation that saw the clear and present danger of madmen in power around the world. There was no doubt in his mind or of those who consulted with the president, one specific nation was in the process of doing much more than just seeking to explore space. They were seeking to make space their final platform for war on those who did not fall in line with their communist way of thinking. There was a reason for not just national security, but for taking yet another chance at global peace to make a stand and decide where the next step for America and the world would be. Whether it will become a force for good or ill depends on man. And only if the United States occupies a position of preeminence can we help decide whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace or a new terrifying theater of war. I do not say that we should or will go unprotected against the hostile misuse of space any more than we go unprotected against the hostile use of land or sea. But I do say that space can be explored and mastered without feeding the fires of war, without repeating the mistakes that man has made in extending his writ around this globe of ours. The cynical will say that Kennedy took that bold step not just to stave off the galactic dogs of war that was envisioned by a certain nation on the other side of the earth, but only to prove that we were America. We were the ones who should launch ourselves into the heavens first, and being second had no place in the American lexicon. Whether he did it for selfish reasons, foolish pride, ego, or the honorable desire to ensure missiles and the places to launch them from were not the first structures in space. That is for historians to decide. The point is John Kennedy had a proper vision. He knew how to galvanize a nation, how to show the world that America was the greatest nation on earth and would never take a back seat to anyone especially one nation we choose to go to the moon we choose to go to the moon we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things not because they are easy but because they are hard waking up from death great shadow Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30 seconds. Forward, drift. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. I'm going to step off the limb. That's one small step for man. One July 20th, 1969, 45 years ago Sunday passed. America's fulfilled John Kennedy's dream and for the time ensured that space would not be used as a dark weapon. On that day, there was no doubt that space would remain free in large part because we were the ones who made it happen. We were the nation who had the willpower, the drive, the desire, the guts to ensure our Cold War enemy would have control of the highest ground. We were a nation that had the leadership to keep true evil in check, a nation that didn't need help from phony friends. And now 45 years later, who gives us a ride into the space we conquered? The nation led by madmen, killers and thieves, ones who think nothing of murdering 298 civilians. And there is at this moment nothing we can do about it or at the very least seem willing to do. John Kennedy would be ashamed. You should be too. And that is telling it like it is. And Midpoint continues right here on the Newsmax TV network. The first time I heard the word grandma, what, at my age? <laughs> no way. But then you hold him in your arms, oh, and everything changes. <laughs> this is my first grandchild, Stephen, and I want to be a part of his life for a long, long time. But you can't take care of your family until you take care of yourself. And now with Fast Five from Nutrisystem, you can lose weight fast. Lose five pounds your first week or your money back, guaranteed. Nutrisystem helps me do just that. I lost 50 pounds and I feel great. Order your 28 day my way plan right now and we'll rush you the Fast Five free. You'll get one week of fantastic energizing shakes to rev your metabolism, one week of delicious craving crusher shakes to crush those cravings, plus one week of meals absolutely free. Glamma? Yeah, I can own that. I'm a glamma. <laughs> Don't wait, call Nutrisystem today. Start losing weight today. Call now, 877-316-SIZE and lose your first five pounds free. This is a national health care alert from the Health Hotline. 
If you, a family member, or a loved one suffers from knee pain and have Medicare as your primary insurance, we've got great news. You could qualify for a pain-relieving knee brace at little or no cost to you. Get free delivery, and all the paperwork is handled by our accredited suppliers at no charge to you. If you're on Medicare and have knee pain, don't wait. You may qualify to immediately receive a pain-relieving brace at little or no cost. Call the health hotline right now for details toll-free at 877-530-9847. Friendly agents are standing by 24-7 to help you. We also have other pain relieving braces available for shoulder, ankle, and your back. You may be eligible to receive these items and more at little or no cost to you as well. Call right now for details toll free at 877-530-9847. Please remember this number, 877-530-9847. Our friendly representatives are standing by now to take your call. Please call us right now at 877-530-9847. Vladimir Putin remains convinced that the longer he continues to deny any Russian involvement in the death of 298 civilians, the easier it will be for him to slide from any real responsibility. The sad fact is he might be right, and that is despite the mounting evidence against him. Former CIA analyst Lisa Ruth digs into the details. Another investigative group has been looking into another facet of the IRS and nonprofit groups. No, you may not refuse to pay your taxes because they can't get their act together, but this one will bring new ideas into the dark money concept. And here's a novel idea. Run the U.S. military like a business, but seek to do it better and more efficiently than the IRS, of course. That and much more as we spell out the facts better than any alphabet network can. The fastest three hours of news continues as we question everything for Monday, July 21st, 2014. As the world gets another day to learn about the travesty unfolding in the blocked investigation of flight MH17, we also turn to the Sunday news programs where it's mostly off the cuff and sometimes more than a bit shocking. All this kicks in after Francesca Page deals this, uh, this edition of Newsmax Now. Welcome back. I'm Francesca Page and here's your Newsmax Now update. In a special report earlier today, President Barack Obama is calling for international investigators to have immediate and full access to the site in eastern Ukraine, where a passenger jet was shot down last week. Russia has extraordinary influence over these separatists. No one denies that. Russia has urged them on. Russia has trained them. We know that Russia has armed them with military equipment and weapons, including anti-aircraft weapons. Key separatist leaders are Russian citizens. So given its direct influence over the separatists, Russia, and President Putin in particular, has direct responsibility to compel them to cooperate with the investigation. The White House says the missile that brought down the Malaysia Airlines plane was fired from an area controlled by the separatists. And British Prime Minister David Cameron had some fighting words for Russian President Putin. He told Putin he'd better allow international experts to, uh, experts to access the site of the down Malaysian plane. Well, it is an absolutely horrific incident that's taken place. And what uh, I said to Vladimir Putin is that the world today is watching Russia. The pressure has been growing on Putin, who the US and others say has backed and armed the rebels in Ukraine. That's your Newsmax Now update. Now back to Midpoint. <laughs> Tens of thousands are displaced. They're living in UNRWA UN schools. The tragedy in Gaza is beyond uh, comprehension. The hospitals are overwhelmed with number of injured civilians. The equipment are not sufficient. The, uh, the, the, the medicine is not uh, uh, sufficient to deal with the needs of our people. This crime has to be stopped, and it has to be stopped immediately. 
New numbers speak the mind of the American people clearly. They want America to stay out of both the Middle East and Ukraine. And while politicians and policymakers are often swayed by such surveys, it would seem impossible for President Obama to remain neutral in any sense of the imagination, what with American lives being put in danger and war drums beating to the tune of American involvement. Let's welcome back to Midpoint. From LigNet, the Langley Intelligent Group Network, former CIA analyst Lisa Ruth joins us in studio. Good to see you again. Good to see you as well. Let's get down to missiles here, because I think this is where a lot of the, the crux of an argument usually is. The Israelis claim beyond the shadow of a doubt that missiles are being fired from hospitals, they're being kept in hospitals and schools. To be very honest, we don't see any photographic evidence of this. We hear the Israelis talking about this. To be completely fair, does the intelligence that LigNet has and that others have in the intelligence community community indicate beyond the shadow of a doubt that Hamas is using human shields and putting their missiles in these places. Well, we do know, we know from the UN, for example, that there were missiles there at, at this the UN refugee sites in the hospitals. What is unclear is how widespread that is. Humanitarian organizations are in a difficult spot and as most listeners probably know. For example, if you work for the CIA, you can never work for these humanitarian organizations. They have to develop, build trust where they are. That means they may not ask as many questions as they should. Um, if Hamas is using them, and I think there are enough examples to suggest that there are at least incidents of it, I don't believe the humanitarian organizations are, are condoning it or helping it. However, you know, it certainly raises questions. Um, the human shield issue, we keep hearing differing views on that. I don't know. I don't think it's out of the question. We do know Hamas is telling people not to leave, you know, despite the fact mm -hmm. that the Israelis are coming in and saying, we're going to bomb your cities. You need to get out. Hamas is saying, no, they're not. Stay where you are. So that's not exactly human shield, but it certainly puts people, civilians, in danger. Many of the humanitarian organizations are just trying to do that. They're trying to protect what they believe, according to the United Nations, is a 70% civilian death rate on the Palestinian side. So let's be fair. They are looking at it from that side, but they simply don't have the intelligence that it takes to make that 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 conclusion that oh no wait a minute it's not as bad as you fear exactly and right now you you are dealing with a humanitarian crisis food and water for example so these the people there just don't have the ability i think you're exactly right going back to who's at fault here hamas however is exploiting the opportunity taking the opportunity to put missiles in these places and, and it, it puts the, the humanitarian organizations in a very difficult spot. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and want to play a soundbite here because I want people to hear this too. This is from Ron Prosser, the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, basically discussing Hamas rejecting the humanitarian ceasefire to basically allow the people of Gaza to have some help. Listen up. Hamas rejected a humanitarian ceasefire to basically allow the people of Gaza to have some help but they kept on shooting, showing exactly, exactly what they are really interested in, and that is not exactly the welfare of the people of Gaza. Is it fair to say, Lisa, that as far as intelligence tells us, we know that Hamas is a representative form of their government. It is a form of the people of Palestine have basically come out and said, represent us. But do all the Palestinians want this? There are those people who say that there's many Palestinians who simply don't agree with what Hamas is doing right now, yet they are caught in the crossfire. Absolutely. And, and you have to look back again. Hamas was elected, and you have to look at why that is. Hamas, ironically, back to the aid situation, provides a lot of social services inside Gaza. And in many cases, they're the only organization providing aid inside Gaza. That said, Pretty consistently, the humanitarian workers, the intelligence workers are saying Palestinians in the Gaza Strip want peace. They want this to stop. I want you to stop right there because that's a point. Now, there are many people who say that it bodes well for Israel to have peace. Mm -hmm. They want the Gaza Strip. As a matter of fact, there were times when they were trying to help the Gaza Strip become autonomous. So it's not as if this is a, a shoot-happy government here because it really behooves the Israelis as well to have peace in that side and not have missiles lobbed at them. I, I think people miss that a lot of times. Well, in both sides, again, even this, this ground assault, it's a risk for Israel. You know, if you're going in, you risk casualties on your own soldiers. You risk international backlash. It's not something I don't think they take it lightly. It is given a choice, Israel would prefer for peace. But you're in a situation right now, I do believe, where Israeli public opinion 
is saying, we can't take this anymore. No more shooting at us. We're not messing around anymore. And as the ambassador talked about the Hamas not, not agreeing to a ceasefire, remember, they turned down an initial ceasefire from Egypt. Mm -hmm. And Israel saying, we will agree to a ceasefire. You know, what do you do with that? Well, here's, and this comes from the Israeli defense minister. I'm going to show a quote here as well, which speaks to our next point here. We are prepared to continue the operation as long as necessary, and if there is a need, we will recruit more reserve combat forces until we bring quiet from the Gaza Strip. The thing that stops me right there in a lot of people is those civilian casualties again. There are, and I think this still goes to the four young boys who were on the beach who were killed by an Israeli missile. People are going, wait a minute, what are you shooting at the beach for? Right. The Israelis will say we have intelligence that says there are missiles being held there or there is something there. As we try to be as fair as possible on this show at all times, is it not fair to say that there have been mistakes here and that maybe there needs to be a real pullback here? You know, with war, let's be honest. Yes. When you're having war, civilian casualties, and you're talking about the Gaza Strip, which is one of the most densely populated places in the world. It's very, very difficult, if not impossible. And we do know the Israelis are dropping leaflets and telling people to leave. On the other hand, where are they going to go? You know, we're getting into this situation. You can't go to your uncle's house because your uncle's house is also being bombed. It's not quite that easy. I, I think that the tunnels, you know, we're talking about the stockpiles of the weapons, but the tunnels are equally, if not more so important both to Hamas and to Israel. And so some of these bombings are coming not even to take out stockpiles, but to take out these tunnels. Well, the tunnels themselves, let's deal with mm -hmm. that right now. There are those who will say the tunnels are there for kidnappings. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, I tend to think that that's a little simplistic. There must be more of a reason for these tunnels. Oh, you bet. That They are used to smuggle goods, people, ammunition, weapons. They store weapons inside the tunnels. The kidnapping issue, and, and we have heard this. In 2013, Hamas said, admitted, supposedly, that they use them for kidnappings. But we have not heard of instances of that happening, kidnappings for ransom anyway. I, I don't rule it out. But really, if you look at the tunnels, it allows access. Gaza is closed off. And keep in mind, if you look at a map, they are boxed in. And the only way to, to get across, get goods, people, weapons in and out, these tunnels provide easy access. If you look at Israel, they have an inexhaustible supply of weapons, uh, ordnance, certainly of missiles as well, because the United States gives them Patriot mm -hmm. missiles as well to help Iron Dome. What about Hamas, though? How long can they continue? Uh, because obviously they're being fed by the bad guys. Yeah, and interesting, some of this uh, funding and weapon sourcing is interesting and to look at this conflict because historically Hamas was funded and provided weapons by both Iran and Syria. Now, they get money from a lot of other places. I know in 2009, Forbes did an analysis and found that of the $10 billion that Hamas got, $7 billion came from the U.S., the U.N., Saudi Arabia, and other Arab nations. They get it from charities, a lot of other places. But Hamas had a little bit of a falling out with Iran and Syria a few years ago when it went became very good friends with Mohammed Morsi in Egypt. Mm -hmm. it, Iran didn't like that too much that because they th they thought th this was part of this Sunni Shiite conflict and that that Iran thought that Hamas had abandoned the Shiites. Well, Morsi's gone, so now Hamas is looking back, and there are some people who believe that part of the attack on Israel was to get. Iranian and Syrian attention again, mm -hmm. coming back saying, oh, we're back against Ir the Israelis and you should fund us. How long can they hold out? That's going to be interesting. I think there's a good possibility that what we're going to see is Hamas saving itself, Hamas coming up with a negotiation because they need to survive and figuring they can rebuild their weapon stashes later. But I go back to the tunnels. I think the tunnels are more important to them right now than the weapon stockpiles. They can they can refill their weapon stockpiles. The tunnels are critical to them. They need to have them. About 90 seconds we have left. What you've just said, obviously the Israelis know. Mm -hmm. Because if they don't go in, take care of business, quite frankly, they're going to see more stockpiling of weapons. The tunnels will just come back. There will be new tunnels dug. Is this strategically, tactically the best opportunity that Israel has to try and shut down Hamas as effectively as they possibly can? And my quick answer is the reason they went in, in my opinion, the ground operation was enough is enough. 
we're going to go in, we're going to decimate them the best we can. We know they can rebuild their weapons, but we're going to take them out the best way we can. And I think that's what we're seeing. Is it fair to say that, simply put, there is no win here for the president when it comes to this? Because, again, Americans in a new poll in Politico said, we don't want to go to Ukraine, we don't want to go to the Middle East. About all he can do at this point is harsh language. Absolutely. And it carries over there right now. But he's almost on the sidelines. And well, pretty ineffective, too. They don't even want him there. And that's what, I, you know, the Egyptians don't want him there. He has very little play, really. You know, we can say really tough words, but as you said, looking at Ukraine, looking at Gaza, looking around the world, really, right now, what else are we going to do? And just keep, I guess all people want is just to continue to support Israel, which is really what he's doing, and that'll be weapons, that'll be money, that'll be everything else in order to try and get the job done. But boots on the ground is a bad idea. No matter. And the Israelis, the Israelis won't allow that anyway. They're a sovereign nation, and quite frankly, many people will say they have just as good a military as anybody else in the world. Absolutely. At least it's always a pleasure. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Thanks so much for coming in. We will continue to cover this story all day long, of course. For in-depth analysis and forecasting on Russia, Ukraine, Israel, and more, we invite you to go to lignet.com, L-I-G-N-E-T.com. Next up, more black bags being tossed around the IRS with a new investigation revealing what kind of cash will still be flowing at the midterm elections. And here you thought the IRS was in control. <laughs> We're in control. Midpoint continues. Meet Mary. She loves to shop online with her debit card. And so does Bill an identity thief who stole Mary's identity, took over her bank accounts, and stole her hard-earned money. Unfortunately, millions of Americans just like you learn all it may take is a little misplaced information to wreak havoc on your life. This is identity theft, and no one helps stop it better than LifeLock. LifeLock offers the most comprehensive identity theft protection available. If Mary had LifeLock's bank account alerts, she may have been notified before it was too late. LifeLock's credit notification service is on the job 24-7. As soon as they detect a threat to your identity within their network, they will alert you, protecting you, before the damage is done. LifeLock has the most comprehensive identity theft protection available, guarding your social security number, your money, your credit, even the equity in your home. My years as a prosecutor taught me that we all need to protect ourselves from crime. In today's world, that includes identity theft. It's a serious problem. We all have to protect ourselves. While identity theft can't be completely stopped, no one works harder to protect you than LifeLock. You even get a $1 million service guarantee. That's security no one can beat. You have so much to protect and nothing to lose. When you call LifeLock right now and get 60 days of identity theft protection risk-free. That's right, 60 days risk-free. Use promo code NOTME. Order now and get this document shredder to keep sensitive documents out of the wrong hands. A $29 value, free. Don't wait until you become the next victim. Call 1-800-918-3128 for 60 days of LifeLock identity theft protection risk-free and get a document shredder free. Use promo code NOTME. Call 1-800-918-3128 now. Now on Newsmax TV. Has a new border war erupted with Mexico? Find out the surprising truth. Watch Newsmax TV to find out. Go now to Newsmax TV. handling of information across all platforms borders on criminal idiocy. The IRS is frying hard drives, the VA is drowning in paper. Is there any record-keeping medium that the government could use that could work for the microfiche? We'll do it. <laughs> Stone tablets? We'll do it. We could take a page out of the ancient Greeks, weave all of our important information into an epic poem and recite entirely from memory, passed down over generations as part of a federal archival oral tradition from bard to apprentice, but you'd probably lose that page. Or use crayon from what we've been seeing, right? It's exactly what more than a few people and groups wanted. The Internal Revenue Service caught up in a whirlwind of accusations and investigations, unsteady, wobbling about trying to protect itself 
and in the process leaving certain money machines a wide avenue to work their dollar dumping magic and just in time for the midterm elections. Bring back the crayons. Welcome to Midpoint. Senior reporter for the Center for Public Integrity, David Leventhal, joins us on the show. David, thanks for being here. Hey, it's a pleasure. Good to be with you. David, get us up on this whole study here because this goes back to Crossroads GPS, and that's the group that Carl Rove and Ed Gillespie were involved in here. Kind of give us a little quick synopsis here of how this all began. Sure. Well, of course, uh, the headlines uh, over the past couple of years, really, uh, and especially lately, have been all about uh, the, the Tea Party scandal, the targeting of conservative groups by the IRS uh, for uh, reasons that, of course, a lot of people uh, thought were absolutely disastrous and wrong. But what we wanted to try to do with this report is uh, dig several layers deeper, go back not only a couple of years, but a couple of decades to look at this part of the IRS that's responsible for overseeing nonprofit groups and get to the bottom of what it does and whether it does its job or not, whether it follows the law or not. And the bottom line, is that it really isn't. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that the exempt organizations division, which is this kind of uh, arcane uh, element of the IRS, uh, it is, uh, number one, losing staff at a very, very large rate, losing money at a very large rate. It has a federal mandate to do a whole lot of things according to law, but yet at the same time, it's not able to, according to uh, all the interviews that we did and all the research that we did as part of this project, uh, it really can't do its job or follow the law at the degree that one would expect it to. Didn't the IRS, though, bring this on themselves with decades of stunningly, unbelievably bad management and overlaying constants on top of constants and new rules on top of new rules. They, they really did this to themselves, though, didn't they? There, there seems to be two things going on. Number one, uh, you're right. The IRS has not been its own, uh, own best uh, advocate uh, and own best ally uh, in making a lot of mistakes uh, over the past many decades. Of course, the IRS is not everyone's favorite agency. I bet if you did a poll of 100 Americans, you wouldn't have a single one who would say, oh, I love the IRS. But at the same time, too, Congress uh, has been routinely and almost systematically uh, cutting resources to this particular element of the IRS uh, that is a little different. And, and if you'll indulge me, uh, most of the IRS is all about bringing in money. It's about collecting tax revenue. This particular division is all about making sure that nonprofit organizations are operating in the way that they should be so that they don't have to give taxes to the federal government. So. For the average taxpayer, for somebody wondering, well, what does this exactly mean for me? It means this. If you have organizations that are nonprofit groups, but really shouldn't be nonprofit groups, then in a way, taxpayers are subsidizing the actions of groups that shouldn't be nonprofits. So regardless of whether you're conservative or liberal or Democrat or Republican, if you've got a lot of these groups uh, running around and acting in a political way, but they shouldn't be, uh, then you know, you're almost opening your wallet to make sure that these organizations can keep operating unfettered, even when uh, by law they shouldn't be operating quite in that way. It really does strike to the heart of the whole scandal that's come up over the past couple of years. But at the same time, too, uh, this is something that has its roots going back, again, uh, more than a couple of years, but a couple of decades. Doesn't this open itself up to an astounding amount of criminality when you think about it? And, and that's really the issue that the IRS is trying to grapple with right now. Uh, first of all, the rules are very fuzzy. Uh, there's this principle of if you're a nonprofit group, if you're a so-called social welfare organization, and these are the groups that have become very, very political in some cases over the past few years. Uh, they're engaging in political activity. They're advocating for and against candidates. As a nonprofit group, you can do that to some degree, but you're not supposed to have a primary purpose of engaging in that type of activity. So the IRS's role in all of this is to kind of be the cop on the beat to make sure that they're not engaging in political activity to that degree. And if they are, then they force them to register as a kind of group that would actually have to pay taxes in order to, uh, to engage in that type of activity. Either a political group uh, or a different type of nonprofit. Don't want to get too far in the weeds, but uh, the IRS effectively has uh, been doing that uh, almost not at all over the past couple of years. Uh, they, they've really uh, just uh, been in a very bad position, and part of that uh, is them being their own worst enemy. Part of that is Congress definitely cutting off resources, and part of that is uh, just grappling with uh, the, the main issue at hand, which is being investigated by multiple committees in Congress, which is uh, how bad did they screw up when, uh, when they started going after Tea Party organizations in particular. Can we just say now, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the nonprofit division of the Internal Revenue Service 
is just as scared as they possibly could be at this point, and they are paralyzed by fear, just not wanting to do anything? They are absolutely paralyzed. They're, they're not taking any demonstrable action in the here and now regarding these types of groups. Now, that remains to be seen whether in the future, and we're talking after the 2014 midterm elections, whether they're going to do something. Uh, in particular, clarify the rules surrounding these types of nonprofit organizations that are engaging in pol pol uh, political activity. Now, we've talked to uh, the commissioner of the IRS, John Koskinen. He's told us in an interview that come 2015, that they are going to revisit the idea of writing rules, being very specific in exactly what it means to be a nonprofit and engage in political activity. Uh, they tried doing that last year. It was met with a whole bunch of resistance, not only from Republican and conservative groups that felt that they were uh, patently unfair in many of the rules that they proposed, but also many liberal groups too that felt that they went too far in other degrees. And again, I can't underscore enough that uh, you know this is something where you have conservative groups and liberal groups engaging in this type of activity. There are uh, plenty of uh, liberal groups this election cycle that are nonprofit organizations that are very much advocating for liberal candidates uh, as well as the ones uh, on the right as well. So this is uh, both sides playing it and uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, clarity in the rules that exist today, which is why the IRS, uh, at least if it's going to do one thing, is going to try to focus uh, on the issue of clarifying the rules so that everyone understands what it means to engage in political activity if you're a nonprofit organization. All right, now in the study, you quote Larry Gibbs, a former IRS commissioner who served under Reagan and H.W. Bush, and he said, quote, nonprofit regulation is, and here's the quote, the most explosive, difficult, and challenging area of the IRS, unquote. Is that just simply because you really don't have a handle on where this money is going? So when we talk about midterms and political campaigns, there's a lot of money buried there. But it doesn't always have to show up. It just kind of mysteriously happens to wander in. Well, it, in, in a way, it does. So the standard for any political committee, you might be talking about a PAC. You might be talking about a super PAC. Even the committees, the political committees that candidates themselves are, are, are uh, part and parcel of, what they have to do, they can engage in political activity effectively any way they want to. But they do have to do a couple of things. Number one, they have to account for the money that's being spent. But more importantly, they have to disclose where the money's coming from. The principle and the idea behind that being, all right, you're running in a public election. You've got people voting for you one way or another. They deserve the information to, the, to make a good decision about who's supporting your candidacy or who's supporting your organization. The difference with nonprofit groups is even though they're not supposed to have that primary purpose of engaging uh, in politics, they can do so to, to a significant degree and they don't have to disclose their donors. They don't have to tell the public who's behind them. So if you've got some conservative group coming in and spending millions of dollars in a race, we really don't know where that money is truly coming from, save for the name of the organization itself, which oftentimes uh, means very little to the voting public. Conversely, same thing with liberal groups. Uh, if you've got uh, an organization coming in with millions of dollars and touting some liberal politician, then we don't know where that money is coming from either. So that's really the rub here and why so many people are agitated about this, why so many people are upset about this. Uh, and, and to a larger degree, it speaks to uh, one's ability as an organization, uh, a nonprofit organization, to speak freely. And you do have a lot of uh, conservatives out there who say, well, this doesn't really upset me all that much. They're an organization. They should have the right to engage in politics, regardless of whether they're a political committee or a nonprofit. Uh, so there is that element of the debate as well. Ten seconds. Quick answer here. Is the big thing here for the public to realize that now, with the IRS frozen, there's money going into the midterms, there's money funding political campaigns, and here we go, all worried about how much money it is, and the guy with the biggest wallet can basically get the most done. The bottom line is there will be tens of millions of dollars, and there already has been, from nonprofit organizations that do not have to disclose their donors flowing into the 2014 midterms. And if the IRS doesn't do anything about that, you can expect that happening in 2016 to a whole new level. I know there's got to just be some people smiling about the IRS being frozen and not being able to do anything, but it's not all that good, really. David Leventhal, thanks so much for joining us, my friend. Excellent report. We'll talk again soon. Hey, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and remember, it doesn't mean you can't pay your taxes either, all right? Just, uh, I know that's what you're thinking. After the break, John Kerry, Peter King, and Jason Riley sounding off on the Sunday News Gab Fests. And still in this hour, Around the Dial with Lars Larson from KXL Radio in Portland, Oregon. That and a whole lot more coming up as we continue right here on Midpoint. Smile!
No matter how well you provide for your family today, if you don't have life insurance, their future may be at risk. Think about what would happen if you were gone. Would they struggle to pay the bills and face an uncertain future? They don't have to. You can help guarantee those you love $200,000, $500,000, $750,000 or more with life insurance through AIG Direct. We'll help you get more for your money, up to 70% more. Just look, less than $14 a month buys a 40-year-old man a $250,000 term life policy. That's up to three times what you can get from other companies for the same price. No wonder millions of people rely on AIG companies. The call is free, the quote is free, and there's no obligation. Make the future more secure for those you love. Call now so you can sleep better at night. For a free quote, call 1-800-558-5246 or visit AIGdirect.com. The following is an important message for all men. Are you urinating more frequently? Do you wake up to urinate? Are you having a slower, weaker stream? By 50, half of all men already have a prostate issue, and it only gets worse with age. Don't ignore the warning signs of an aging prostate. Call or go online in the next 10 minutes, and we'll ship you a free 30-day supply of Super Beta Prostate, the best-selling non-prescription formula for prostate support. Super Beta Prostate is guaranteed to support a more complete emptying of your bladder, a fuller, stronger stream, and less waking at night to urinate. Super Beta Prostate has a trusted 10-year history in prostate care, having shipped over 6 million bottles. I've gotten used to getting up multiple times a night and, you know, kind of adapted to that. You might say I thought that was maybe normal. And once I started taking Super Beta, now it's down to zero. Now with Super Beta, I find that I can comfortably get to my destination without the concern of this uncontrollable urge to want to use the bathroom. The Super Beta Prostate is a product that I really like. I endorse it. I use it myself. I have done the research on the ingredients. I was very pleasantly surprised that Super Beta Prostate helped me fairly quickly. Super Beta Prostate is available without a prescription. It's formulated with a special and natural plant enzyme called beta cytosterol, which was shown in multiple clinical studies to support healthy prostate function. Super Beta Prostate is so powerful, you'd have to take 100 sol palmetto pills to get the same sterols as just one Super Beta Prostate tablet. So don't ignore the warning signs of your aging prostate. Get your free bottle of Super Beta Prostate today. Due to extremely limited supplies, only one free bottle per household. Call right now to get your free bottle while it's still free. Go to SuperBeta.com or call 800-494-2084. 800-494-2084. 800 <laughs> Welcome back. I'm Francesca Page, and here's your Newsmax Now update. The Islamic State is threatening centuries-old Christian towns throughout northern Iraq. Christians are being forced to flee from their homes as ISIS says non-Muslims must convert unless they want to pay a tax or, worse, face death. Iraqi Christians are currently hiding in churches throughout Iraq, and a local bishop says they are on the verge of being exterminated. And the Islamic State's leader, Abu al-Baghdadi, is giving non-Muslims a deadline to leave their homes and says after this date, there is nothing between us but them and the sword. Meanwhile, the latest Politico poll says only 19% of respondents favor further U.S. involvement in Iraq's civil war. Amid widespread violence throughout the world, specifically in the Middle East, the poll suggests that Americans want the U.S. to stay out of that region. 44% of those surveyed say they favor less involvement in Iraq, and 23% say the current level of involvement is appropriate. The numbers surrounding U.S. involvement in Afghanistan, Syria, and other areas of the world tell the same story, stay out and keep out. The good news coming out of this poll for the GOP is that 39% of respondents say they'd, ra they'd rather entrust Republicans with foreign policy issues. That's 7% more than those who trust Democrats. That's your Newsmax Now update. Now back to Midpoint. Thank you, Francesca. As you might guess, the Sunday talk shows were filled with only really two issues, and that's what's going on in the Ukraine right now with the downing of Malaysian MH17 and also what is happening now in the... Um, in Russia and also in the Middle East as well. So let's go ahead and get started. First stop is CNN's State of the Union with Candy Crowley. Secretary of State John Kerry said Russia has not done what is necessary to bring the pro-Russian separatists under control. This is a very, very critical moment for Russia to step up 
publicly and join in the effort in order to make sure there is a full-fledged investigation that the investigators and people who are coming to help from outside, the uh, ICAO, the uh, FBI, the, N the National Transportation Safety Board, we're sending people over, others are sending people, experts who have an ability to be able to put these facts together so no one will have doubt, no fingers will be pointed about conspiracies, about ideology and politics governing this. We want the facts. And the fact that the separatists are controlling this in a way that is preventing people from getting there, even as the site is tampered with, makes its own statement about culpability and responsibility. Follow that up on Face the Nation on CBS. Congressman Peter King out of New York says Russia supplied the weapon that took down Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, so the Russians are the one who should bear responsibility. It says that Putin has shown he is incapable of functioning in a civilized world. There can be no reasonable doubt now that Russia was involved, that Putin was involved. Uh, by supplying this type of weaponry to a group of thugs like the Ukrainian separatists, you have to bear responsibility for what happens after that. <clears throat> and this really is a game changer. That, I think, is the point that the uh, U.S. and our Western allies have to make clear to Putin that the rules of the game have now changed. He has violated civilized norms. And I think that we have to take very severe economic sanctions and also ones that are symbolic. Uh, for instance, I think uh, we should talk about uh, canceling the World Cup. Why should co uh, countries be going in the World Cup to Moscow? Uh, why should, uh, for instance, Aeroflot be allowed to continue to have landing rights? So long as Putin is not allowing access to the uh, crash site, so long as the, uh, the crime scene there is being totally uh, polluted, this man has shown that he's really incapable of functioning in a civilized world. And during a roundtable discussion on Meet the Press, Jason Riley, who joined us right here in Midpoint on Friday past, he questioned President Obama's leadership while Putin attends to, quote, rebuild the Russian Empire. Vladimir Putin is rebuilding the Russian Empire, and Obama is worried about maintaining a light footprint mm -hmm. internationally. And what happens is a void. A power vacuum is created, and people like Vladimir Putin are more than happy to make mischief here. And that's, uh, Senator Graham mentioned Syria. I think there was something of a turning point there. We set a red line. Mm -hmm. Assad ignored it. There were no consequences. Should be pointed out to you that the president held a press conference earlier today, basically really just making a statement, uh, lashing out at Vladimir Putin and the Russians, uh, basically saying that they need to get off the stick and get something done here. Uh, let's be very honest. Don't hold your breath for Vladimir Putin to do anything of any real reasoning. Next up, another Medical Minute with Dr. Chauncey Crandall. Heart disease is the biggest killer disease in America, and this doesn't surprise me. We are addicted to starches, sugars, fatty meats, and salt. People who live in countries with little heart disease eat very differently. One way some people stay heart healthy is by following what is known as the caveman or Stonehenge diet, so named because of its similarity to the way our prehistoric ancestors ate. People who follow this type of diet live off local fruits and root vegetables and get their protein mostly from fish and wild game they shoot themselves. Now, since most of us don't hunt or fish for all our protein, here are some simple tips on how you can start to eat like a caveman, modern day style. First, fill up on fruits and vegetables. Eat them first and you'll be less hungry. Feast on fish which is rich in nutrients, but not in calories. Choose fatty fish like mackerel, herring, sardines, and salmon, which are rich in heart-healthy omega-3 fatty acids. Get out and go for a walk. Remember, our ancestors were hunters and gatherers, so they didn't spend their time sitting in front of a TV or computer all day. If you live more like a caveman or a cavewoman, your heart will love you for it. I'm Dr. Chauncey Crandall, and thank you for watching this Heart Health Minute. Remember, it's never too late to prevent or reverse heart disease. Right now, I invite you to discover your own risk for heart disease or even a heart attack by taking my quick, free online quiz at www.simplehearttest.com.
Do you have questions about Medicare? Are you new to Medicare? Are you wondering about your choices? With over 30 years of Medicare experience, United Healthcare Medicare Solutions can help. Call now to learn more about plans available to you, including AARP Medicare plans, or to get this free Medicare Made Clear answer guide. It was created to help make the different parts of Medicare easier to understand. Medicare has two main parts, parts A and B, to help cover a lot of your expenses, like hospital care and doctor visits. But they still won't cover all of your costs. United Healthcare has the information you need to help you be better prepared when making Medicare decisions. So call toll free now or visit us online. Are you looking for something nice and easy, like a single plan that combines Medicare parts A and B with medical and drug coverage? Well, a Medicare Advantage plan can give you doctor, hospital, and prescription drug coverage all in one plan. Maybe you'd like help paying for your prescriptions. Consider a Part D prescription drug plan. These plans can help reduce the cost of your prescription drugs. Call now to learn more about what United Healthcare offers, like AARP Medicare plans. We'll send you Medicare Made Clear free. One of the many ways United Healthcare can help guide you through your Medicare choices. If you or someone you love is new to Medicare, retiring, losing employers' retiree health benefits, or simply looking for answers to Medicare questions, like what's the difference between parts A, B, C, and D, call toll free now or visit us online and download your guide free at answers to medicare.com slash TV. It's full of useful information to help you understand your Medicare choices. And it's only from United Healthcare Medicare Solutions. Call right now or visit us online. Pentagon is the only agency that cannot produce a budget that can be audited and presented to the American people. Every other agency passes those tests in terms of financial audits. We here at Midpoint always do more than just question everything. We bring in those voices who like us seeking more than the hyperbolic media truth, seeking something just a bit deeper, a lot more intelligent too. Around the Dial gives us a chance to present some of the best and brightest talk radio minds and mouths from across the country. So let's welcome in one of the top-rated syndicated talkers in America, slinging that brand of talk from the studios at KXL Radio in Portland, Oregon, since 1997. Let's welcome Lars Larson from the Lars Larson Show yeah. to Midpoint And it's well. a pleasure to be on with you. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. It's okay, Lars. I read it just like you handed it to me, big boy, so it's 25 bucks on the dime. There you go. We're all set to go. Let's hit you on the news items. First of all, I know we want to talk about some military spending here that we just alluded to a second ago in that soundbite. But first, let's get your reaction right now to what's happening in the world. The president comes out, takes his shots at Vladimir Putin, basically saying, what exactly are they trying to hide? There are those on one side who will say the reason that Putin gets away with it is because America does not have strong leadership. Another side saying there's not much he can do in the first place. Where do you stand? Well, I'll tell you something. I didn't think I would ever do this, but I think Samantha Power at the United Nations last week was sounding a whole lot more forceful than President Obama is today. She came out with a full-on indictment of what Russia has done. Russia put the weapons in the hands of these people. It now appears that the missile was either fired from Russian territory or, if we accept the president's version of things, the Russian-made and supplied missile was fired from the Ukraine, and then that missile missile system was apparently withdrawn back across the border. So Russia's got blood on its hands in this case. And what does the president do? Well, we really, really want to get our investigators on the scene as quickly as we can. And, uh, and, and Putin won't facilitate that. This is really a weak response. And I'll tell you how I think we got to here. 
How we got to here is a president who, before the election two years ago, was promising Putin more flexibility, which he gave him. Then he drew a red line in the sand about Syria that he wasn't prepared to enforce, and Putin saw that, and he acted on it. And then Putin invaded Crime the Crimean Peninsula, and now... Uh, some of Putin's thugs have apparently used Putin's weapons to shoot down a jetliner and take the lives of 298 people. And all the president could say is, would you please let our investigators into the crash scene? The president needs to be a whole lot more forceful than he's being right now. All right, let's get on to what we led to here at the beginning of the hour right now, beginning of the segment, I, sh I should say. You recently had a guest on your show, Corey Shockey, a research fellow at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. And she was talking about the U.S. paying for the upkeep of unused bases, the tremendous amount of money that is spent for the military. But she talked about making the military, or running at least, like it's a business. Explain what she had in mind. Well, there are a couple of things about that. The, business, the uh, uh, Pentagon does not run like a business right now. As you pointed out in the introduction, it's not capable of being audited the way we would audit a lot of other agencies. And, Ed, I'll go back a number of years into the Bush administration. We did a radio broadcast for a day from the Pentagon. We had done that a few times during Bush's presidency. And I got a chance to interview a guy by the name of Dove Zakheim. And when I asked him to, to describe what his job was, he said, if we were a corporation, I would be the chief financial officer the CFO and he said one of his biggest concerns is that as the CFO he said we're allowed to move approximately three-quarters of one percent of the Pentagon budget everything else is specified as to where that money will be spent within the budget now imagine trying to improve the outcomes at a corporation if out of the entire budget 99 and a quarter percent of it cannot be changed it's all written down in stone and only three quarters of one percent can be changed and that's a lot uh, that's an awful lot of what Corey Shockey was talking about the fact that we have weapon systems that are purchased because of political decisions made on Capitol Hill that benefit the home districts of a lot of members of Congress their weapon systems that in many cases the Pentagon says it doesn't want doesn't need or can't use or weapon systems that flat don't work if you want to have a Pentagon that actually is capable of doing what it needs to do, protecting American security in an era like we're in now, you need something that's fast and nimble and where the weapons and the systems that we buy for the people at the Pentagon and for men and women in uniform are ones that actually work and do the jobs they need them to do. I'm just shocked like everybody else. You were talking there about cronyism and payoffs. I'm, I'm just stunned, actually, well, that you would bring that to the fore. <laughs> That's exactly, that is exactly what it is, and we all know that we're told, and in fact, Corey Shockey had a number of specific examples uh, that come from various parts of the country where they say, we're going to keep flying. Ah, we're going to wait and see. See, we're going to keep flying. I'm telling you exactly what happened there is somebody in the military will start a controversy right here. It's a conspiracy. They stopped Lars Larson from talking to us. <laughs> Lars, you're there. Go ahead. you got 30 seconds. Finish that. I want to get one more in here real quick. Is a lot of members of Congress are trying to benefit their own districts, and we get weapon systems we don't need or want. See, that'll teach you now again. Go after the military, Lars. That'll teach us right here. <laughs> All right, let's talk about millennials here. This is an interesting. I want to put some sure. numbers here for people to see because this is really fascinating. How many people are living at home anymore? About almost 24 percent of people aged 25 to 34 live with their parents, grandparents, or both. In a new Pew study. That's up from a little under 19% in 2007, just prior to the global financial crisis. 11% in 1980. These are the people that are going to set our fortunes, that are going to run the future here. You, you have to wonder, what, what's going on here? I thought the millennials were supposed to be this, this generation that would be able to overcome all this. No, you know what we have right now, Ed, and this is my read on it. I know, and my, my wife and I know friends who have their 30-year-old kids still living at home. And it's a very nice lifestyle for the kids. They're no longer anxious like I was, and perhaps you were, to get out of the house and start making our own way in the world as quickly as possible, even when that meant taking a drop in our lifestyle because we weren't living in as nice a house as mom and dad had. My dad was a forest ranger, so his house wasn't much. But what I rented, uh, you know, to when I moved out on my own wasn't anything compared to what my dad had. So, you know, what you have is millennials who are now encouraged by government policy. Obamacare says stay on mom and dad's insurance till you're 26. And there doesn't seem to be any, you know, any burning desire in a lot of these millennials to get out and start making it happen for themselves. I don't know about you, but I had a burning desire to get out of the house. It was my mom and dad going, when are you leaving? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
left when I left when I was 18 years old, and I never spent more than 24 hours in my dad's house ever from that point forward because I Sorry. wanted to be independent. Exactly. I went back to visit, but I wanted to be independent. Lars, you are always independent indeed. KXO Radio, Portland, Oregon, a whole lot more. Lars, pleasure to have you on the show again, my friend. Let's do it again and keep things rolling out west. Thanks very much, Ed. Take care. All right, Lars Larson joining us right here. Around the dial, we do that every week. We bring in some great radio talkers right here on Midpoint. Next hour on Midpoint, a call for the Obama administration to stop focusing on help for illegal immigrants, but to focus back home on what a certain segment of the population really needs. And next up, the lies and cover-up in Ukraine over MH17. It's right here on Midpoint. Meet Mary. She loves to shop online with her debit card. And so does Bill, an identity thief who stole Mary's identity, took over her bank accounts, and stole her hard-earned money. Unfortunately, millions of Americans just like you learn all it may take is a little misplaced information to wreak havoc on your life. This is identity theft, and no one helps stop it better than LifeLock. LifeLock offers the most comprehensive identity theft protection available. If Mary had LifeLock's bank account alerts, she may have been notified before it was too late. LifeLock's credit notification service is on the job 24-7. As soon as they detect a threat to your identity within their network, they will alert you, protecting you before the damage is done. LifeLock has the most comprehensive identity theft protection available, guarding your social security number, your money, your credit, even the equity in your home. My years as a prosecutor taught me that we all need to protect ourselves from crime. In today's world, that includes identity theft. It's a serious problem. We all have to protect ourselves. While identity theft can't be completely stopped, no one works harder to protect you than LifeLock. You even get a $1 million service guarantee. That's security no one can beat. You have so much to protect and nothing to lose. When you call LifeLock right now and get 60 days of identity theft protection risk-free, that's right. 60 days risk-free. Use promo code not me. Order now and get this document shredder to keep sensitive documents out of the wrong hands. A $29 value, free. Don't wait until you become the next victim. Call 1-800-918-3128 for 60 days of LifeLock identity theft protection risk-free and get a document shredder free. Use promo code not me. Call 1-800-918-3128 now. The psoriasis on my feet was so bad that it felt as if I were walking on broken glass. If you suffer from psoriasis, you know it can feel like a curse. I was hiding in the house all the time. I didn't want to be out with the public at all, didn't want people seeing me. If you're tired of the pain and embarrassment of your psoriasis and would like to take control of it, then you want Extract by Photomedics the global leader in targeted therapy for psoriasis. Extract can clear your psoriasis in weeks with no harmful side effects. Extract treats all psoriasis areas. The in-office treatment takes no time at all. After the treatment, often I hear, I couldn't even feel anything. Are you done? You do not feel a thing. She'd go, zzz, 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 and then it would be done. Extract is cleared by the FDA and recommended by over 2,000 dermatologists. I was seeing results within like two or three treatments. Extract is covered by all major insurance companies and Medicare. One of the worst areas was my right elbow and after about two months you can see it's totally clear. Act now and you can qualify to be reimbursed for any co-pays until you see results. It feels great. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, now I know how everyone else feels that has a healthy scalp. So call now for your no-cost treatment at an extract clinic conveniently located near you. We can see you right away. For all the folks who have given up hope on their psoriasis and felt like there is no solution, I would love for them to come in and give our extract treatment a try and see what a difference it can make in their lives. Stop suffering from psoriasis. Live clear, live free with extract. Call 1-800-741-0957 for your no-cost extract treatment at a location near you or go to useextract.com right now. So call 1-800-741-0957.
The level of cover-up and human indignity reaches new levels almost on an hourly basis in the Ukraine. Forensic investigators have finally reached the MH17 crash site. This has power fails for the refrigerated rail cars being used to house the recovered bodies of the 298 people who perished. And the military left behind refuses to allow the train to move or the investigation to proceed unimpeded. The lies and the unfolding tragedy, the subject of this edition of News Call. Three days after the crash and after three days of outcry from the families of the victims that they were still lying exposed and decomposing among the wreckage, the local authorities finally began to move them away. Under the supervision of the rebel militias that control the site, workers began loading the dead onto trucks and took them to a train waiting with refrigerated cars at a station about 10 miles away. Observers from the OSCE, the European Security Organization, were brought to the train to view the bodies, but delegation spokesman Michael Borkirkov said they couldn't count or examine them. The self-defense forces in control of this area say they've made several appeals to the international community to get a team of experts here as soon as possible. We want a comprehensive and objective investigation, but we don't feel like there's enthusiasm among the international community and experts. Several dozen experts are currently in Kiev. We're asking them, please come here faster. We are surprised and frankly angered that we have to keep the area untouched while we've been waiting for them for so long. Meanwhile, Kiev has already rushed to accuse the anti-government forces of meddling with the crash scene. This morning, international monitors have arrived at the crash site. Local machines still working on Sunday, moving large pieces of the downed Malaysian plane, removing even more bodies from the wreckage. And overnight, strong words from Australia's prime minister. The Russian-backed rebels having those people in control of the site is a little like leaving criminals in control of a crime scene. New video from local rebels recorded just after the crash. This man rummaging through a backpack. This is the second man who came up to me in more documents and a wallet with credit cards. Oh God, this is, this is actually pretty awful. Where do we give it? We don't know, we know. You give it? We give it, yes. We give it, yes. This is a this is a Dutch citizen, pretty awful, but also shows you how badly organized it all is. These miners were brought in to comb through the fields, find the bodies, find um, any sort of evidence that they can get, but they don't even know who to give this to. They're coming up to us and giving this to us. This is supposed to be a solution. Busloads of coal miners. Still grimy from an underground shift, they're ordered to fan out through tall wheat and grass. Some hold a line, most don't. It's not precise or thorough. It's an improvised attempt to deal with a desperately under-resourced and unqualified disaster response. These men tell me they want to help. They don't believe pro-Russian militants shot down the aircraft. The rebel gunmen are also here, watching not searching. Western investigators finally arrived this morning. A Dutch team, trained to identify bodies, inspected the refrigerated train cars where the victims have been taken. They say they will be able to move them today. Four full days after the crash, huge pieces of aircraft metal are still unguarded. These are luggage compartments. Nearby, people's bags appear to have been opened. Despicable. Earlier today, President Obama held a news conference where he made some statements about a number of issues, one of them, of course, being MH17. And I now quote from the president, now's the time for President Putin and Russia to pivot away from the strategy that they've been taking and get serious about trying to resolve hostilities within Ukraine. The big comment that he made that has everybody talking right now is a simple question that the president asked and everybody else would like to ask as well. What are they trying to hide? I think that's sort of obvious at this point, but we will continue to ask the question as everybody else around the world will. Hour three is about to kick in. The international implications piling up in the wake of MH17. The plea for a president to pay attention to the needs of Americans first. Do you sleep too hot while your partner sleeps too cool? Do you struggle to sleep at the right temperature? 
Now Sleep Number has a solution that's as revolutionary as its beds. Introducing the Sleep Number Dual Temp Layer. The amazing Sleep Number Dual Temp Layer allows both of you to select your ideal temperature for better sleep. The Sleep Number Dual Temp Layer works with any mattress brand. It features active air technology, which evenly distributes air to heat and cool each side to the temperature you prefer for head-to-toe comfort. Call or click now for this free $50 savings card and catalog. My husband and I both prefer different temperatures. He likes to have his side of the bed a little bit warmer, and I like to have mine a little bit cooler, and we are finally sleeping better together. After sleeping on a dual temp layer, I find that I have such a restful night's sleep that when I wake up in the morning, I am energized and I'm ready for the day. All night long, you can each enjoy sleep at a temperature that perfectly matches what your body needs for comfortable sleep. So you can sleep better together. In a research study, 75% reported poor sleep because of their sleeping temperature. That's because your body's temperature naturally fluctuates at night. But with the Sleep Number Dual Temp Layer, you can sleep comfortably warm or cool. And because the revolutionary Sleep Number Dual Temp Layer helped solve an important sleep problem, it was selected as a very innovative product by Good Housekeeping. Remember, the Sleep Number Dual Temp Layer can be added to any mattress brand, so everyone can enjoy sleeping better at the perfect temperature. Call or click now. Call 1-800-317-5283 or click now for a free $50 savings card and catalog with Priceless. For your peace of mind, the Sleep Number Dual Temp Layer comes with a 100-night in-home trial. Call 1-800-317-5283 or click now. That's 1-800-317-5283 for your free $50 savings card and catalog. Vladimir Putin continues to heap insolence and insult on those who lost loved ones in the MH17 shootdown, calling for the crash to bring people together in a time of conflict. We remove the covering from his latest snow job and get some facts. One fact the president should realize, his drive to help illegal immigrants is severely impacting the help needed by a certain segment of the American people. And we'll talk to one calling for the president to wake up. And what is reality when it comes to the supposed health risks being posed by those crossing the border from South America? No one covers every angle of a story like we do, for this is the fastest three hours of news. This is Midpoint, where we question everything from Monday, July 21st, 2014. Of course, the really burning question in America at the moment is, with NFL training camps about to get underway, is the White House happy to see something else that will divert the attention of most Americans away from various disasters? Mull it over as we take a break and get this edition of Newsmax Now from Francesca Page. Welcome back. I'm Francesca Page, and here's your Newsmax Now update. Right now, now, there is a new update in the trial of Boston Bomber's friend. Sarnev's college friend has been found guilty of obstruction of justice and conspiracy. He now faces a maximum of 25 years in prison for both charges. Sarnov, who is accused of setting off two bombs at the Boston Marathon finish line, will stand in trial in November. And now today's latest reports indicate that seven Israeli soldiers have been killed in clashes with Hamas militants. Meanwhile, Israel strikes continue to pound Gaza as the death toll reaches Palestinians more than 500. More than 20 Israelis have also died since Operation Protective Edge began. And earlier today, Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz joined John Bachman on America's Forum and had this to say about Israel's offensive against Hamas. Israel is fighting for the entire Western world, the entire civilized world, because if terrorism is allowed to continue from hospitals and mosques and schools, and that's what Hamas uses to launch their rockets, <clears throat> then, you know, it's coming to a theater near you. In the meantime, the Israeli military released images from a neighborhood in Gaza suspected of housing rocket launchers. The picture you say, see here shows four aerial shots of hospitals, playgrounds, and mosques where Hamas is hiding weapons it uses against Israel. And Secretary of State John Kerry is currently on his way to Cairo in hopes of spearheading a new round of ceasefire talks. 
The Kerry is catching some heat over remarks he made on a hot mic during a Sunday news show yesterday. Uh, it's a hell of a pinpoint operation. It's a hell of a pinpoint operation. What? Oh, is responding. We've got to get over there. <clears throat> Thank you, John. I think, John, we ought to go tonight. I think it's crazy to be sitting around. Jen Psaki says she's not going to debate whether or not Fox News allowed an acceptable, acceptable protocol by Kerry's private comments. But she says regardless, his private comments were consistent with his publicly stated view on all five shows. Israel has the right to defend itself, including against recent tunnel attacks. And the State Department spokeswoman adds that the secretary is working on steps to de-escalate the situation in Gaza and hopes to achieve a ceasefire agreement. That's your Newsmax Now update. Now back to Midpoint. The world also wants to see a real change in the stance that Russia has taken over the crisis in the Ukraine. We need no more weapons crossing the border, no more troops crossing the border, no more support for the separatists, respect for the Ukrainian territorial integrity. That is what is required and that is what must be pushed for. Americans have spoken in several polls. They want nothing to do with what is currently boiling over in the Middle East and they certainly don't want to get involved in the mess that is Ukraine. However, with both regions spinning dangerously out of control and America involved no matter how we try to stay away, how long can the Obama administration stay restrained? And what will our decision mean to what can only be described as weak international standing? Welcome back to Midpoint. President of the London Center for Policy Research and co-author of the book, The Sunni Vanguard. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Herb London back into Midpoint once again. Dr. London, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. The president made his statement today basically aimed right at Vladimir Putin. Of course, it was more harsh language. In actuality, though, there were those who were going to say he really could do nothing more than that at the present time. Is that the case, or should he have taken a greater step forward and been more pointed to the Russian president? I think he could be more pointed, and I think America does have some leverage. One, we can freeze all Russian assets across the globe. Clearly, that's one thing that could be done. And certainly, our allies might be inclined to join us in that activity. Second, there's no reason why the president can't deploy a squadron of F-16s that are placed in Ukraine with the acceptance of the Ukrainian government. And three, there's no reason why we can't arm the Ukrainians with fairly sophisticated weapons, a request that was made earlier to the White House and denied. So there is leverage that we have, but the president has chosen not to act. The very fact that he appears equivocal is in the mind of Putin a sign of weakness. One of the reasons why Putin feels as though he can engage in the kind of activity he has in supporting the rebels, the Russian supporting or supported rebels, is because he realizes that this White House is unlikely to do anything in return. Let's look at what might be the easiest to do here. The F-16s, the arming, the, the insurgents, let's put that aside for the moment. Let's look at the economic sanctions and the leverage that is there right now. If the president has this at his disposal at this moment, there are those who would ask, why does he dither and allow this man to continue to think he can get away with it? Is it simply because he doesn't feel he has the authority to do it? Is he afraid? Is he what, what there has to be a reason here and the American people are dying to know? Well, I think the reason has become very obvious. You may recall that when the mic was off, the president indicated uh, in a, in a approximately a year and a half ago that we would engage in further flexibility. He has also made it clear that the United States is not willing to engage in kind of global activities. By and large, there have been one opportunity after another where the president has withdrawn and suggested that the United States has no role to play. This is true with the standing forces in Iraq. It's true with the statement that was made about Syria. So that the United States is engaged in withdrawal from international affairs based on the assumption that Mr. Obama has that the United States' involvement has no positive effect on the way in which Global Affairs Act. And that, by and large, has been the sentiment on the part of this administration. It's one of the reasons why people around the globe are asking the obvious question. Where is the United States? What role can we play? Is the United States the balance wheel in creating international equilibrium, or is it not? And the answer is it's not, not at the moment. 
Is it simply a matter that we are too stretched at this point? We are too thin. We are still trying to get out of a theater of war in the Middle East right now. You have public sentiment that says we don't want to be there. We don't want to be in the Middle East. We don't want to be in the Ukraine. So is this seriously a president who's going, we don't have the ability to go in and be effective? Well, keep in mind that the United States is suffering from a kind of war fatigue. But war fatigue is very much related to leadership. If the president were to mount a real campaign and talk about the need for the United States to involve itself in various areas of the world where we have national interest, I think the public would go along with him. But if the president doesn't make that argument, obviously the public is not going to re respond appropriately. Now, my feeling about this, uh, this matter is that the president of the United States has the ability to use American forces around the world without necessarily being the policemen of the world. We can no longer play that role. But there are interests that we have. We, are, we certainly have the opportunity to deploy forces when necessary, so the United States should actively involve itself in areas where our interests are at stake. And one could make the case that our interests are clearly at stake in Israel, because what happens in Israel happens to the Middle East. If you allow terrorism to take its role in Israel, there is no doubt in my mind that it will have a profound effect on world affairs. Is this as simple as saying, as some people would, and again, these are critics of the president who would say that he simply lacks the political guts to get something done? I think that it's not a question of political guts. It's a question of a philosophical standard that the president have, has about not involving the United States in international affairs. The withdrawal from international affairs has been based in part on the apologies that have been made around the globe about previous efforts on the part of the United States. It's been based on the sentiments that were expressed at Cairo. It is based on resetting, not simply the role with Russia, but resetting the role of the United States in the whole matter of global affairs. Let me get down to a couple of statements here. First of all, I want to show you and I want to uh, read a statement. Uh, and this is from Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko, and I think this pretty much sets everything up. Three notorious crimes were committed. The first crime is a terrorist attack committed from Russian weapons by Russian terrorists and Russian mercenaries. The second crime, I can't look calmly at how the terrorists treated the bodies of those who died. Thirdly, destroying the evidence is absolutely unacceptable. If we are going to take all this and we are going to ask Putin to do something, to do anything, don't we still need to have the EU behind us? Because Germany is right now trying to get cozy with Russia in a number of deals. You have the rest of the EU, which doesn't seem, and I'm going to go back to that phraseology again, political guts or political fortitude, whatever you call it, they don't seem to have the wherewithal to do it. And the third part of that is going to be the energy tap that the Russians control right now. It would seem as if the Europeans are trapped, but could they just say, that's it, we have to do something regardless of how it hurts us? Well, I think that there is no question in my mind that the Europeans have understood how to love freedom but not how to defend it. And this is certainly true in the German case. They are going to come to the realization that the Russian natural gas that they depend on is obviously an extortion mechanism that is employed by the Russians whenever they run into a situation where there's a moral dilemma. The Russians can always say, fine, you're not happy about the stance we've taken. We can shut the tap. We can turn off the faucet. No longer electricity for your part of the world. The response on the part of the United States should be, we will do everything in our power to make sure you get your natural gas. We can now export natural gas. We can do something even more significant. We can exploit the Leviathan in the Mediterranean, controlled by the Israelis. There is a method that can be used by the Australians, they've used it very effectively, of converting natural gas into liquid gas and have it transported across the seas and provide whatever the Ukraine needs and whatever Europe needs, probably at a discounted price. So there is no doubt that we can do an awful lot on this score to make sure that the Russians do not use natural gas as a weapon. And it is a weapon. Moreover, it's the only hard currency that the Russians possess. They need oil and natural gas prices to be high in order to sustain their economy, which is failing in every other respect. Let me get back to weapons. You mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, you talked about three things that the president could do. You mentioned leverage. The second one was F-16s. The third one was arm the Ukrainians. Isn't that really, though, what the United States does not want to do? Again, you have a population that you said is war weary right here. And if we are lending F-16s and then arming the Ukrainians, is that not just part of that slippery slope and puts America into another theater of operation? Well, I don't think that that's true. I think that you can deploy F-16s do so at the behest of the Ukrainian government, but not necessarily sending forces. These are airplanes that you're sending. They know how to fly those airplanes, and we can provide the instructions, just as the, the, the Russians 
probably provided instructions for the SA-11. This is a fairly sophisticated weapon. It's not as if these farmers who are supposedly rebels fighting on behalf of the Russian government know anything at all about the sophisticated technology. So we can certainly provide that kind of weapons for the Ukrainian government. They did request it. They didn't say send American troops. They didn't say send American forces. There's a lot you can do in the diplomatic front, on the economic front, and on this armament front without necessarily talking about the deployment of forces. Is what we have seen in the Ukraine evidence beyond a shadow of a doubt that Putin has lost control over the individuals who are there, whether it be military or separatists, whatever it is, because it would seem as if they are acting on their own. They may be getting some orders from Moscow, but it still seems to be as if they are acting as part of a rogue military. I don't think this is rogue at all. I think the Russians have been dictating the terms of that warfare. I think they put this force together. I think these mercenaries are paid by the Russian government. I think the SA-11 could not be, could not have been fired unless there was some active involvement, some participation by a fairly sophisticated, knowledgeable Russian source who could show them how to use it or use it himself. I do not believe that this is a rogue group. I think by and large, the Russians have been very much dictating to them the terms of their engagement and the fact that they are involved at all is directly related to Putin's, Putin's attitude. 30 seconds. Does this just tell us that Putin's attitude is, I'm going to get this country back, I'm going to do what I want to do, I am going to create a new Cold War. You can't stop me. Try it. I think he's trying to create the greater Russia. It's an attempt to recreate the Soviet Union. The near abroad is going to be incorporated into the new Russia, as he sees it, a great power in the Eurasian, the Eurasian continent. It is frightening to think about that we once went through a Cold War, but we may be sitting right on top of one all over again. Herb, it is a pleasure to have you on the show once again. We'll absolutely do it again. And again, the book for Dr. Herb London is SUNY Vanguard. We make note that you should look it up on Amazon because it is a fascinating read. Dr. London, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Coming up next, the Obama administration continues to avoid the reality of illegal immigration paying more attention to a certain segment of the American population first and foremost. That is the opinion of our next guest. We'll dig into that a whole lot more when Midpoint continues right here on the Newsmax TV network. Love the way your tires look right after applying tire shine, but hate that it washes right off with the first rainy day? Well, not anymore. Introducing White New Tires, the world's longest lasting tire dressing, a full six months. Just apply White New Tires and let it dry. Your tire's shiny new finish will be protected from snow, slush, and road salts, from mud and muck, and from heat and sand, along with all the normal dust and road grime. And the shine won't wash away. You just see my truck on camera. And as much as I love to go off roading, I trust only White New to keep it light new. Want proof? We applied White New to half of this tire and sent it through over 100 powerful car washes. White New Tire never washes away. White New Tire will last for six months of real world environmental exposure, and we guarantee it. Traditional tire dressings can leave a greasy residue and even contain silicone that actually attracts dust. Here's how it works. Our revolutionary tire formula bonds to the surface of your tires. Leaves no greasy residue, won't crack or peel, and most importantly, won't wash away, leaving only the white new tire shine. Your tires will look better than new for months to come. Ordinary tire products need to be applied every car wash. Plus, they cause overspray and sling. Not the best thing for your paint. What a waste of time and money. Just apply white new tire shine once, saving you extra work and well over $100 at the car wash. White new tire is only $14.99. Call right now and we'll double your order. Just pay additional handling. That's two white new tire kits, enough to keep the tires on two cars looking shiny and new for a full six months. That's right, you get two white new tire kits for just $14.99. Call now. Order white new tires right now and we'll double the offer. That's right, enough white new tires for two cars. Enjoy your showroom new look for six months, we guarantee it. Call 1-800-401-8251. Call now. Now on Newsmax TV. Has a new border war erupted with Mexico? Find out the surprising truth. Watch Newsmax TV to find out. Go now to Newsmax TV.
And this is an issue of national importance. This is as important as any issue that I work on. It's an issue that goes to the very heart of why I, I ran for president. Because if America stands for anything, it stands for the idea of opportunity for everybody. The notion that no matter who you are or where you came from or the, the circumstances into which you are born, if you work hard, if you take responsibility, then you can make it in this country. All you have to do is watch any of the shots from various border points and demonstrations. You'll find what appear to be average Americans angry that their needs are not being cared for, and instead their government seems more concerned with the welfare of those coming to the country illegally. Our next guest says there is one certain segment of the population disproportionately affected, and that should be the president's first and foremost concern. Welcome into Midpoint, founder of the Black American Leadership Alliance, Leah Durant joins us today. Leah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I want to get to your first statement here where you said the average Americans feel like they are left behind and not adequately represented in the amnesty debate. Would you expand on that, please? I, I Absolutely. I think what we're seeing is an absolute disconnect on the part of political elites, uh, you know, the financial elites that have decided that they have an agenda, which is to bring as many people into this country as possible. You know, right now we're seeing so many people that are hurting, struggling to feed their families. And a lot of people are outraged. They're looking at the way that the Obama administration is handling this debacle, and they're frustrated that their needs are not being taken, that, they're not, that their needs are not being cared for. Meanwhile, we're spending millions and oftentimes billions of dollars sending money to Central and South America to quell disturbances, to quell gang violence, but we're not doing anything to care for the needs of U.S. citizens that were born right here in this country. As part of the Black American Leadership Alliance, are you not specifically also focusing on African American kids and African American communities and jobs in that community as well? Well, absolutely. We care about jobs for all Americans. We care about jobs for all low-skilled workers. But when you look at the fact that right now black unemployment is double that of whites, you talk about, you know, the, the administration talks about a humanitarian crisis down on the border. We absolutely have a humanitarian crisis right here in cities like South Compton, Washington, D.C., uh, Chicago, and all over this country. So I think if you're going to talk about, you know, putting Americans back to work, we've got to look at the policies that we have that are forcing Americans out of jobs every day. And unfortunately, that's where we're seeing take place right in our home countries here in the United States. Is it fair to say then that there are African Americans who feel as if they are still betrayed by this president? Absolutely. I think you see it all over. There was a wonderful piece that came out just last week where people from Chicago were outraged. I think you're seeing that people are frustrated with the mismanagement of what's taking place down on the border. I have to say I've been down on the border myself, I've been down to the West Texas border as well as to Arizona, and you see just absolute haphazard mismanagement. People are frustrated that they have not seen this president take it seriously enough to actually go down to the border and address these issues himself. Uh, and people are upset about the joblessness and the poverty that we're seeing in our own country. Uh, and really, they're not feeling like this administration is doing anything to alleviate any of that. There's a lot of hurting, a lot of poverty, and people see the administration with huge government outlay, outlays for, for illegal aliens, and they really just want the government to step up and do their job and make sure that Americans are taken care of first. Let's talk about that for a moment, because as you talk about the Obama administration certainly not doing things, I know a number of the cities that you're concerned about are the same ones that we hear in the news every day. The, the massive unemployment, the crime that is rife in Chicago and Detroit, places like that. Is that not part and parcel a problem with the local government that has to deal with things? And if there are questions to be had and if there are people who are not doing their job and money being misspent, does that not also reach down into the fact that certainly in some of these cities, it's seen that they've got governments there that aren't exactly honest at all times to begin with as well. Right. No, I, I completely agree with that. But I do think that the local governments take their signal and their cues on how to handle these issues from the federal government. And when you look at an issue like immigration, you know, the Supreme Courts have established that immigration is an issue that the federal government has to deal with. Now, you look at a lot of these communities, they're competing for jobs for these very same jobs that people Okay, I think we've had some technical difficulty there. Hold on one second because the Skype froze. We're going to try and get Leah Durant back here in just a couple of moments here. Let me bring you up to speed then, quite frankly, on what she had said. This was said over the weekend again, 
saying that the average Americans feel like they are left behind and not adequately represented in the amnesty debate, talking about disaffected voters who are fed up with political elites and both parties overwhelmingly against amnesty while their leaders are on a completely different page. I want to focus on that, Leah. I understand you're back with me again here. Both parties overwhelmingly against amnesty. It would seem to many people that the Democratic side is not against amnesty. That's what they want. Well, I guess my point is that everyday Americans, whether they hail from the right or left, they're frustrated by this issue. They see it in their communities. They understand it. They see that it impacts their abilities to get jobs. It prevents them from finding the work that they need to find, and it depresses their wages when they do. So I think that the average, everyday, working-class American understands this issue better than anyone. The problem is that you're seeing the political elites in Washington and those who stand to benefit really just deciding that it's to their gain to allow as many people into the country with complete disregard for how it impacts low-skilled workers. Is so that's, it, our, that's our main concern. Is it fair to say, because we are told, and again, that the popular idea out there is that many African Americans are still fans of the president, that they are still on the president's side, that they believe he has their best interests at heart here. Are you telling us, and would you believe in your opinion, that that is a, a media fabrication? Is that something that is overstated? I do think it's overstated. And I think finally you're starting to hear voices in the black community. You're starting to sense this level of outrage by people as they see their communities, they see the poverty stricken areas in their communities, they see the unemployment, they see that we've got nearly 40 million Americans that are on food stamps. I mean, these are real issues and these are real issues that are impacting these communities. And they understand that it's a lack of leadership on, part, on the part of this administration, uh, which is why we're experiencing a lot of these things, especially with regard to immigration. Uh, so, again, I do think that's a media fabrication. I think we'll start to see more outrage that we've seen just this past week on the part of black pe people in the black community. Why do we not then hear more African-American lawmakers speaking out, even the Democrats who are sitting there? Because if there is this problem, and it is among their constituents, and the constituency are the ones that are upset about how they are being treated, why don't we hear it from them? I think you see many of them towing the political line, unfortunately. I think it's the same thing that we see uh, on the part of many leaders that are not in the African-American community. These are people that stand to benefit from this, this president's policy of opening the borders and allowing as many people in as possible. Fortunately for us, we feel like we do have the American people on our side. And when you look at the polling on this issue, I've got to say time and time again, it shows that the American people want a couple of things. They want the administration, whether it's a president that's a Republican or a Democrat, they want them to stand up and enforce the laws and make sure that immigration laws work for the American public. And I think that's the problem. That's what we're not seeing here. Uh, so again, I think average everyday Americans understand this issue. They would like to see our immigration laws enforced. And really, I think people are tired of seeing our immigration laws be made a mockery of. And that really is what we're talking about here when you talk about what's going on down on the, uh, on the Texas border. Okay, so your group, Bala, and many others are the ones who are saying, we need change, we need something done. All right, I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. A couple of minutes we have left because there are always those asking, what are the answers? All right, from your perspective then, what are the answers? What needs to be done right now? Absolutely. I think we need to mandate E-Verify to make sure that the jobs that we have in the country remain in the country. Those jobs in the hotel industry, restaurant industry, construction, we need to make sure that these are going to hardworking Americans who need these jobs to raise their families and support their families. We'd like to see more enforcement, uh, more enforcement opportunities for local law officials. We've had wonderful programs like the 287G program. We need to make sure that the federal government is working in concert with our local law enforcement. These are just a couple of steps that could be taken to make sure that our immigration laws are enforced and that more jobs that are here in the country go to those citizens who deserve them. I think you may have uh, frozen. No, you didn't. Okay. One thing I do want to ask you about, please, if you won't mind, I'm going to ask you about a controversial issue here I'd like you to respond to because it certainly is out there in the news. There are those who report that your organization is a front group for an organization called FAIR, which has been trying for years to drive a wedge between African Americans and Latinos. Would you please respond to that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we're not connected to FAIR, we're not funded by FAIR, we weren't started by FAIR, and that's not to say that I don't disagree with their work. I think they do good work. We are an organization, basically, that looks out for the average, average American worker, uh, regardless of their ethnic background, so we have a specific focus on low-skilled African American workers because there's, there's such a problem in the African American community with poverty and unemployment. Um, so again, I think you're hearing some of these same arguments that the open borders crowd tries to put out there. But the bottom line is 
we support the interests of the average everyday Americans. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's basically where we stand on this issue. 20 seconds left. Would you say that African Americans need to be as well as every individual when it comes down to casting a vote in America to be better educated about whom they vote for and why? Absolutely. I think, unfortunately, in the black community, you've seen a lot of people that were so happy to have an African American president, the first African American president. And that is an historic event. Uh, it, it speaks a lot to where we are in the country. But we also have to be aware of policies and where, where our candidates stand. And I think the immigration issue is the most telling issue. Uh, and I think we need to be watching out to make sure that these policies support the communities rather than harm them. Leah Durant, Black American Leadership Alliance, we thank you so much for joining us. We will do it again. Thank you. All right, later on this hour, what's the truth regarding the possible health risk of illegals crossing the American Southwest border? We hear stories every day. We hear reports. We see headlines on websites that talk about diseases like Ebola coming into the United States. We'll bring some truth to this and a whole lot more when Midpoint continues. Smile. No matter how well you provide for your family today, if you don't have life insurance, their future may be at risk. Think about what would happen if you were gone. Would they struggle to pay the bills and face an uncertain future? They don't have to. You can help guarantee those you love $200,000, $500,000, $750,000 or more with life insurance through AIG Direct. We'll help you get more for your money, up to 70% more. Just look, less than $14 a month buys a 40-year-old man a $250,000 term life policy. That's up to three times what you can get from other companies for the same price. No wonder millions of people rely on AIG companies. The call is free, the quote is free, and there's no obligation. Make the future more secure for those you love. Call now so you can sleep better at night. For a free quote, call 1-800-558-5246 or visit AIGdirect.com. Where's your pain? Right here. Right here. Both elbows. Take on the pain. Introducing CopperFit. Advanced cutting edge compression garments designed to help relieve muscle and joint soreness. Where has this been for the last few years? If I can put this to the rigorous test of an NFL athlete and it can work for me with all the joint pain that I've had, it'll definitely work for you. I pushed this product to the max and it performed great at every level. Helps reduce swelling for faster recovery. Copperfoot has helped me a lot, and I've seen a huge difference. The pain I was having literally felt like someone was stabbing me in the knees. I have pretty much lost all hope. They said, you need to quit. It's not going to get better. I refused. To me, I feel really good inside, and I've accomplished something, and Copperfit has helped me do that. The Copperfit high-performance compression fabric is blended with therapeutic copper, essential to your body. Two technologies combined to help provide support for muscle soreness and aid in recovery and performance, faster recovery, and guaranteed relief of muscle aches and pains. I definitely recommend it to anybody to give it a try that has pain. I noticed that a couple of days after, it didn't really hurt. And I was like, wait a minute, is this real? This is very real. And just with the Copperfit, honestly, for the first week, I've noticed results. Comfortable, lightweight compression sleeves, tough enough for any active lifestyle. Construction isn't light duty. I couldn't pick up a gallon of milk. Within a few days of using the Copper Fit, mobility in my arm was 100% better. It's almost like winning the lottery. Don't make your body wait another minute. Call 1 800 668 4984 or on the web at getcopperfit.com. Get your choice of one compression elbow sleeve or knee for $19.99. Order now and you'll receive a second sleeve free. Try the Copper Fit and watch your life change. Feel the relieving power of copper compression. Feel the power of Copper Fit. Welcome back. I'm Francesca Page and here's your Newsmax Now update. President Obama says it's his administration's focus to stop the fighting in Gaza. The president addressed the nation earlier today during a speech on the White House South Lawn. We have serious concerns about the rising number of Palestinian civilian deaths and the loss of Israeli lives. Secretary of State and John Kerry. That is why it now has to be our focus and the focus of the international community uh, to bring about a ceasefire that ends the fighting and that can stop the deaths of innocent civilians, both in Gaza and in Israel. And Secretary of State John Kerry is headed to Cairo at this moment to revive a ceasefire agreement 
brokered by the Egyptians more than two and a half weeks ago. Meanwhile, more violence is erupting throughout the region as clashes at a Libyan airport killed nearly 50 people last week. What you're seeing here is the aftermath of that fighting. Several planes have been destroyed along with much of the airport in Tripoli. And a ceasefire in Libya came to an end last night and fighting has resumed. That's your Newsmax Now update. Now back to Midpoint. All right, our time now to go ahead and let you know what's happening on our sister shows, America's Forum, that you see 9 o'clock Eastern Time, Monday through Friday, right here on the Newsmax Network, and the Steve Malzberg Show that comes up at 3 o'clock following us right here on the Newsmax TV Network. Let's go ahead and focus on America's Forum. This morning, Congressman Adam Kinzinger, Republican representing the state of Illinois, member of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, once again talking about the leadership of the president here. And this is a, a comment that is shared by a number of people this weekend. He, among many, believes that President Obama administration once again has missed an opportunity, whether it's in Israel or whether it's with MH17, to show real leadership. You think back to when the Russians shut down the Korea airliner, of course they didn't mean to shoot down uh, the airliner itself, but they did, and they bear the responsibility. And you saw a very different reaction from President Reagan as you do today from the Obama administration. I mean, I, I actually kind of chuckled unintentionally when, when you read what Kerry said, because you know, at some point, and, I, and right when this airline was, was down, I thought maybe this would be a moment where the administration turns up the heat and really shows leadership, but I'm just not seeing it. I mean, it's just more and more the same to where David, David Cameron of, of the Brits is actually showing the real leadership on the global stage that the president is, and he takes pride in a measured response, and all measured response means is uh, I'm not going to take any side. We're just going to continue to talk and talk. Note, too, that earlier today the president made a statement about MH17 and about Russia. He said, and I quote, now's the time for President Putin and Russia to pivot away from the strategy that they have been taking and get serious about trying to resolve hostilities within Ukraine. The question that the president is asking that many other people are asking as well is, quote, what are they trying to hide, unquote. This is the question that everybody will be asking for quite some time. And, of course, there is no real answer from the Russian president who decides that it's somebody else's fault. All right, now on the Steve Mulsberg Show on Friday, Michael Barone, senior political analyst at the Washington Examiner, talking about politics, talking about the 2016 elections here, and still trying to decide who will run for the GOP. According to him, it's about a 50-50 shot that Florida Senator Marco Rubio will run for president in 2016. Do I think he's going to run? About a 50-50 chance, I think. I think one thing that... Uh may give him some um, cause to uh, be hesitant is, is the fact that his uh, Florida Senate seat is up in 2016. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, you've got a presidential election with no incumbent running. Uh, and uh, as Barack Obama showed in 2008, a first-term senator uh, can sometimes elevate himself to uh, the top position in our government. All right, here's those times again. Check it out. Well, that was Marco Rubio. He just happened to step in for a couple of moments. That's okay. Now come the times here. Don't forget to check him out 9 o'clock every day, Monday through Friday, Eastern Time for America's Forum with J.D. Hayworth. We're at noon. Steve Mulsberg at 3 o'clock Eastern Time right here on the Newsmax TV Network. Now let's take some time out for another American Moment. Today, a hope of many years standing is in large part fulfilled. The Social Security Act of 1935 was the cornerstone of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal agenda, a program designed to ease the burden of old age by providing a continuing income to those 65 and older, benefits to those unemployed, and protections and assistance to disabled children. At the time, the program was limited in scope since the average American's lifespan in 1940 was just 63 years. But in the dark days of the Great Depression, FDR offered comforting words to a nation emerging from the nation's worst economic crisis in its history, the Great Depression. The first Social Security check was issued on January 31, 1940 to Ida Mae Fuller, who was unmarried. A school teacher and legal secretary, Fuller worked only three years under the new Social Security law, earning her a check in the amount of $22.54. Today, the average Social Security recipient receives a monthly check of $1,294, 
and the law was amended in 1956 to include disability benefits to those who qualify. The program was originally designed as a pay-as-you-go, self-funding trust fund, with equal contributions being made by both the employer as well as the employee, as demonstrated in this 1940 film. As soon as you get the card, show it to your employer. You'll need it on payday, for you must deduct from your salary one and a half percent of your earnings as your share of the cost of Social Security. The plan remains essentially the same today. But the system has a rocky road ahead. In 1950, 16 employees paid into the Social Security system for every one retiree. Today, three workers pay in per retiree. And within two decades, just two workers will pay to support each retiree. Still, since its beginning, hundreds of millions of Americans have and continue to benefit from the program. For Newsmax TV, I'm Bill Curtis, and this is an American Moment. Pat Boone here with a word about bank safety. Do you think your money is safe in the bank? Don't bank on it. A generation ago, bank accounts felt secure and they paid interest. This encouraged the virtue of thrift and saving. But today, bank accounts pay virtually nothing and they've shifted from low risk to high risk. For example, did you know your money deposited in most U.S. banks could be subject to limited withdrawal and even confiscation? Oh, yes. And that's just the first of 19 risks explained in a new white paper entitled Don't Bank on It. You still think your bank deposits are safe? You better get this vital new Don't Bank on It white paper now. Call the number on the screen or visit SwissAmerica.com, the gold standard. Learn how simple it is to become your own banker today. Are you ready to take it all off this summer? I took it all off, and I'm glad I did. 35 pounds gone. If you said that I could get in a bathing suit again, I'd say you're crazy. But I did it. There's still time to look hot and feel great this summer. And now, lose your first five pounds fast with a Fast Five from Nutrisystem. I've lost 40 and a half pounds on Nutrisystem, and I feel fabulous. You'll lose five pounds your first week or your money back, guaranteed. I'm Erin, and I lost 30 pounds. Order your 28-day My Way plan right now, and we'll rush you the Fast Five free. You'll get one week of fantastic energizing shakes, one week of amazing craving crusher shakes, one week of delicious meals, all free. And the best news, call in the next four minutes, and you'll also get the all-new smoothies absolutely free. Millions of people have lost weight with Nutrisystem, and now you can too. Time is running out. Call now and get all this, plus one week of smoothies free. Don't wait. Call 877-295-SIZE and lose your first five pounds free. Hi, I'm Jean, and this is my one and only Henry. We just love scouring flea markets for special treasures. But with my type 2 diabetes, we now spend all the time at the pharmacy. With Medicare, I don't have to. They deliver everything I need right to my door with free shipping. Plus, Medicare takes private policies, Medicaid, even my Medicare. Sleep apnea machines, nebulizers, Medicare has all the finest medical supplies. The best part, Medicare saves us money. Medicare allows us the time to do the things we love. Medicare, we deliver a better life. I've seen three cases of tuberculosis just in the last year from illegal immigrants that are coming into just our community. In this letter, Ritz asked the governor to invoke the state's Emergency Catastrophic Health Act. Department of Health can go in and screen these people for communicable diseases. Ritz says he wants to keep diseases like tuberculosis, syphilis, and leprosy out of Oklahoma. The people that are coming in are not immunized, and they bring in certain diseases that will be foreign to our population. We are daily bombarded with screaming website headlines and alarmingly loud proclamations about how much dangerous disease is crossing the American Southwest border at this time. Yet every time we seek to uncover the facts, the amount of illness always seems to turn up surprisingly low in relation to these reports. So the time has come to uncover some hard facts and perhaps put the hyperbole to rest about what is happening with immigration along the American Southwestern border. Joining us now is the president of the American Health Policy Institute and the former deputy secretary at the Department of Health and Human Services under George W. Bush, Tevi Troy joins us on Newsmax. Tevi, thanks so much for being here. 
Thanks for having me, Ed. I'm glad to clear some stuff up on this. Let's try and clear up one of them. First of all, there was a, a certain unnamed congressman who brought up the words Ebola in his statements about crossing the southwestern border. I know for a fact last time I checked, there's no Ebola that has crossed the border here. Is it fair to say that we are getting hit with an awful lot of hyperbole here? Yeah, it, Ebola is not a concern I would have from people crossing. I mean, the, the, the truth is, if somebody had Ebola, they, they wouldn't even be able to make that trip. And Ebola is something that's found in Africa and is not, uh, we've not seen evidence of it in Latin America or in the U.S. at this point. So I'm, I'm not too worried about Ebola. That doesn't mean there are no health concerns, but I'm not worried about Ebola per se. Tell us what the health concerns are then, because again, we're bombarded with dozens of different diseases, including we just heard syphilis and leprosy as well. So give us an idea of what you understand is the reality. Well, for syphilis, I mean, there are ways to prevent contracting that, and I, you know, I urge people to exercise caution on that front. Uh, the, the diseases that I've heard that there have been uh, some prevalence of, there's been some uh, some scabies, there's lice, it's not technically a disease, but it is a public health condition. Um, scabies, uh, um, tuberculosis, which you mentioned in the intro, is, is a potential concern. One case of H1N1, which is a form of influenza. So, so there are some cases. The truth is these people are being screened for diseases as they come in. There is some kind of HHS screening process that's taking place. I wish HHS would have a little more transparency in the process so we could learn a little bit more about what's going on, but there are, there are some political ramifications here and they're not so eager to let us know everything that's happening. But Ebola and leprosy are, are not high on my, uh, my worry list right now. I'm gonna bring up a statement here that I'm gonna read for you and our audience will see it as well up here on a graphic. This is what I alluded to a few moments ago. This is a Republican Congressman Representative Phil Gingrey. This was his letter to the director of the Centers for Disease Control. Reports of illegal immigrants carrying deadly diseases such as swine flu, dengue fever, Ebola virus, and tuberculosis are particularly concerning. Many of the children who are coming across the border also lack basic vaccinations, such as those to prevent chickenpox or measles. This makes those Americans that are not vaccinated, and especially young children and the elderly, particularly susceptible. Now, when we talk about the fact that we're, we're getting down to vaccinations here, isn't it fair to note that a lot of these children who are coming in from South America are coming in from countries who have socialized medicine, and a lot of them are vaccinated, as, as I believe I saw, 96, 97 percent, a, a monstrously high number of children who come from these countries are vaccinated. You know, there, there are pretty good um, uh, vaccination rates, I would say, th throughout most of the, the Western Hemisphere. And, and I think for the vaccination problem, if there are people who are not vaccinated, I think that's one of the issues that gets taken up before they enter school, which, you know, they, they're coming into the U.S. So I, I would assume that um, they, they have to have some kind of vaccination form. And if they can't demonstrate that they've had these vaccinations, they may, they may have to get those vaccinations. So, um, so, so it, it is true having people who are not vaccinated is a problem. And we've seen, let's say, um, uh, some measles outbreaks from people who were not vaccinated. I'm not saying they came from Latin America, but I'm, I'm just saying that, uh, that if you're not vaccinated, it is a problem. But I, I don't think that is, has been a primary concern here either. All right, now here's uh, some of the notes, and I just brought this up here. Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and Mexico, the four countries sending the largest numbers of unaccompanied minors to the U.S., according to a Pew study, all have higher measles vaccination rates than the United States. Is that true? Um, I don't. I can't say that I know the uh, measles vaccination rates in, in every country south of the border. I do know that there, there are uh, way too many people who have the uh, opportunity to opt out of measles vaccinations in the U.S., and that's something that, uh, that I would like to see less of. Uh, but, but again, the, the, this is something that um, should uh, these people enter school, these kids enter school, um, that, that, that would be sorted out there. Uh, the, the other issue is just a larger issue, which, which is where you said that you've had this issue of uh, unaccompanied minors coming across the border, and that, that in itself is, is a problem and something we should wor be worried about as well. But we should point out as well that what you were saying, there is screening here. Doesn't it get lost sometimes in the whole discourse here that there is at least something being done? I'm going to amend that also by saying with the tremendous flood that comes over, it's fair to say that you could have mistakes. Yeah, you know, and th this is an important point, I mean, and the critics of what's going on uh, down at the border, and you know, I, I have my concerns as well. Uh, on the one hand, they're saying, well, it's terrible these people are coming in and, and not screened, and they, they have a, a public health concern. On the other hand, the fact of the screening is part of a regularization process that's taking place. These people are being screened and looked at and registered in some way and then sent somewhere else in the country, and the, effectively it means they're, they're here for for the long haul, um, even though they, they are illegal. So um, 
you know, on the one hand, you want you you want people to be screened. On the other hand, the this regularization process is leading to a situation where we have a lot of people who effectively have come into the country illegally, and there's no real mechanism to change that fact. I think you touched on this a little bit ago, maybe about uh, 40 seconds we have left here. If Health and Human Services was at least being a little more transparent, a lot of this hyperbole and a lot of this fear would probably go away, you believe? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, th I think HHS, again, for political reasons, isn't really saying every, every disease they're fighting and all the, the problems they're fighting because they know that that could be exaggerated and then, and then um, highlighted. So, uh, But I think more transparency is just generally a good thing in this area, and then we could really sort out what's going on here. So is the simplest thing to say here is, and again, you know, we, we, we try to deal at, at, on both sides here and cover it, listen to some of these things but some people are just sort of parroting rumors that they hear and rumors are the most dangerous things when you get down to any sort of disease control correct look i think we need to secure our border i don't yes. think we should panic about um uh, about diseases going rampant and that does not appear to be what's going on it does not appear hey i very much tevi i very much appreciate this there are so many other issues that we could talk about here unfortunately we're all out of time please come back and let's do this again but thanks for setting us straight happy to do it all right. It is simply something to look at. Tevi Troy points it out. We have said it here on this program several times. Yes, there are problems. Yes, the borders need to be controlled. But sometimes there's just a little too much hyperbole and a few rumors going out there. Calm it down. Let's get the facts on a daily basis. Next up, off to New York and the Daily Call with Steve Molsberg, who follows us right here on the Newsmax TV network. The psoriasis on my feet was so bad that it felt as if I were walking on broken glass. If you suffer from psoriasis, you know it can feel like a curse. I was hiding in the house all the time. I didn't want to be out with the public at all, didn't want people seeing me. If you're tired of the pain and embarrassment of your psoriasis and would like to take control of it, then you want Extract by Photomedics the global leader in targeted therapy for psoriasis. Extract can clear your psoriasis in weeks with no harmful side effects. Extract treats all psoriasis areas. The in-office treatment takes no time at all. After the treatment, often I hear, I couldn't even feel anything. Are you done? You do not feel a thing. But she'd go zzz, 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 and then it would be done. Extract is cleared by the FDA and recommended by over 2,000 dermatologists. I was seeing results within like two or three treatments. Extract is covered by all major insurance companies and Medicare. One of the worst areas was my right elbow and after about two months, you can see it's totally clear. Act now and you can qualify to be reimbursed for any co-pays until you see results. It feels great. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, now I know how everyone else feels that has a healthy scalp. So call now for your no-cost treatment at an extract clinic conveniently located near you. We can see you right away. For all the folks who have given up hope on their psoriasis and felt like there is no solution, I would love for them to come in and give our extract treatment a try and see what a difference it can make in their lives. Stop suffering from psoriasis. Live clear, live free with extract. Call 1-800-741-0957 for your no-cost extract treatment at a location near you or go to useextract.com right now. So call 1-800-741-0957. Tired of faded bumpers, foggy headlights, weathered, sun-damaged vehicles? You've spent time and money applying product again and again to hide those embarrassing parts on your car, only to have that work fade away. Not anymore. Introducing Wipe New, the world's longest-lasting solution for restoring and protecting your vehicle. And we guarantee it to last for years. Just apply Wipe New once. It's quick and easy to do. Just one swipe and watch your car turn showroom new. I've been a professional auto detailer for 30 years. Now I restore faded plastic rather than just clean it. And I do it in no time at all. I apply Wipe New to bumpers, side panels, even dashes and interior plastic. Simply apply it once and it lasts for years. Wipe New is the most revolutionary car care product that I've used in my entire detailing career. We applied Wipe New to the driver's side of this vehicle. We then sent this car through over 100 powerful car washes. Wipe New never faded or washed away, proving that the results will last for years of real-world environmental exposure. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen it, Brando. I got it about two years old, and I've never seen it shine like this. And we guarantee it to last for years. 
Use it on bumpers, decorative outside panels, side view mirrors, even vinyl or leather car seats for a protected showroom new shine. Don't spend a fortune on temporary fixes. Order the revolutionary white new for only $19.99. But wait, order now and we'll double the size. That's enough for two cars. There's still more. Order now and get the pro detailing kit with the headlight applicator bonus. Just pay separate shipping and processing. That's right, white new restores your headlights too. Order now and get it all, plus a two-year guarantee. A $50 value for only $19.99. Order now. To get your white new detailing kit, call 1-800-408-5381. That's 1-800-408-5381. White new comes with a two-year money-back guarantee, so call 1-800-408-5381 today. Ah, things just about over for us now here. Monday's all done. Time to head for New York City. Steve Molsberg standing by the Steve Molsberg Show where he will dazzle you. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. I say that every day, and I know that to be certain because I've known this guy a long time. Trust me. It's all set. Right? Years and years and years and years <laughs> and years. We don't want to talk. <laughs> it's real. Somebody said to me, how long have you known Steve? I said, I don't know, 1950s, 60s, something like that. I don't know. Yeah, just, right, right. I don't know. What time is it? Just, yeah, <laughs> it just seems that way, at least all those years. Hey, how about John oh, Kerry? Boy. Now, yeah, it's you and I, those of us have been in the business a long time. What's one of the first things we learn? When you're on a set or when you're in front of a microphone, always treat the microphone as if it is live at all times. Has not John you Kerry been in front that, of microphones yeah. long enough to know this? Uh, yeah, I would guess, uh, but he didn't yesterday, and uh, his true feelings about Israel were on display uh, when Chris Wallace uh, played him saying uh, he was informed of Palestinian deaths in the region, and he said, yeah, it's a hell of a pinpoint operation, a hell of a pinpoint operation, mocking Israel. And then when he's asked about it and confronted with it, uh, he goes on to blast Hamas. So we know what the real John Kerry thinks, which I'm sure is what the real Barack Obama thinks, and, you know, that's what Israel's up against. Funny, but we had uh, Lisa Ruth from Lignet uh, on here basically talking to us a little bit more about some of the intelligence that's there. I think what catches me an awful lot, and I'm sure this does you as well, the intelligence is just overwhelming on what Hamas does and how they use their people and where they store their missiles and how they launch them and where they launch them from. Yet there still seems to be a, a, a part of this globe that wants to believe that it is all Israel's fault and the Palestinians are being unfairly treated and unfairly bombed. It, it still is their own people. It is their own representatives that are doing this to them. And the intelligence Absolutely. tells us this and, every and, single time. Yeah, and you know, uh, it's, a, it's a good excuse for the anti-Semites of the world to come crawling out of the woodwork. We've seen it violent clashes in Paris and in Germany and uh, you know, all over Western Europe. Um, and uh, it's unfortunate that we have an administration that, uh, you know, Obama today said, uh, you know, Israel's done a lot of damage to Hamas, but, you know, now it's time for a ceasefire. Oh, really? So the tunnels that are there will remain? The rockets that are there will remain because Barack Obama decided it's time for a ceasefire? I don't think that's going to be the case. And uh, by the way, you know, it was time for a ceasefire a long time ago, and Hamas didn't want one. So, you know, but that doesn't count. And how we're negotiating with and, and supporting and financially supporting Hamas as part of a unity government, I still don't understand. But that's welcome to the abomination. You would have to agree with me as well, too, that the world basically laughs at American foreign policy when it comes down to certainly what we're seeing now with MH17. And I've said this, I'm sure you've said it, but I've commented on it as well here. Vladimir Putin is the most smug killer at this point who just sits there, blood on his hands, and he just knows he can get away with just about anything at this point because he not only has... An, an American presidency that is really not willing to get as tough as they possibly could be, but a European Union that pretty much has to bow to whatever he wants done because he's got his finger on that energy tap. Yeah, and they, uh, they're in so many deals with him. And, uh, you know, Peter King is going to join us at the beginning of the show, and we'll get his take on, on what's going on. He's been calling for concrete actions against Russia, like not letting their, uh, their uh, jets uh, land here, and uh, their passenger jets land here in, in, in European airports, uh, not uh, having the 2018 World Cup in, in Russia. Uh, something substantial, something that shows something. Uh, all we get from Obama's lip service, and, and he wants that investigation. You know, when's that investigation going to be complete? In two years? <laughs> um, two years. You're optimistic, Steve. How dare you be so optimistic? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> should, be going, should be going for three or four years. It'll at least be 10 years before we find out what's really going on to the IRS. 
Yeah, so, I mean, yeah don't wait that's for absolutely this. true. All right, you got Peter King and a whole lot more coming up. Again, Steve Mosberg, yeah. 3 o'clock yes, every day right here. Have a wonderful show, my friend. We'll see you again tomorrow. We'll find out what's cooking. Thank you, Ed. All right, boss. Steve Molesberg every day. Let's remind you of the times again. Don't forget, 9 o'clock Eastern Time right here on the Newsmax TV Network. J.D. Hayworth and the folks at America's Forum, we're here at noon Eastern Time. The Steve Molesberg Show, 3 o'clock Eastern Time. Nobody covers the news and gets you the information and the interviews like we do, certainly not the Alphabet Networks. Rock on, true believers. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll do it again on Tuesday. We'll bring you a whole lot more, and we'll be covering all the big stories because, trust me, they'll change every single day. And we'll ask the questions right here. This is Midpoint, and our motto is simple. We question everything.